I guess I'd say I first came across your work. Uh, I think it was March of uh, February or March of 2015. And uh, I was coming, uh, I was pretty fresh off uh, coming across the moon landing stuff and was just reeling inside like, oh my gosh, I saw some crazy car 20 years previously when I was down at UT Austin for my freshman year of school. And they were screaming out the window, the moon landings are fake. And I was like, what? What are these people talking about? Because I was a couple of months away from leaving UT and headed off to, to West Point Military Academy, which I thought was a good idea at the time. And uh, I was like, the moon landings are fake, you're nuts. And so I was, <clears throat> I guess that story really started. I was with my girlfriend in the front yard. I picked up a little telescope and was looking at the moon and was like a huge space junkie at the time. So I had seen everything NASA had put out and was like, there's got to be more footage of this. You know, this is the greatest engineering achievement in mankind's history. How is it that consuming every bit of, you know, PBS documentaries, every documentary there's ever been on space ever, why isn't there more detailed information? Mm -hmm. my girlfriend said, well, get on YouTube. I was like, YouTube? Like, you want me to start typing nonsense and what? Like, okay, let me get on YouTube. And the first thing I came across was Sabrell's, uh, what a funny thing happened on the way to the moon and just watched it over and over again for about three days and then started looking into it, got a hold of, uh, you know, source material and was like, I'll be damned. There's not a single star in any of these pictures. Mm. Right? And then started really getting into the, the photo, like the photographic aspects of it, where it was like, yeah, there's some major inconsistencies here. And I, this is not adding up. And so I was running around town telling all my friends, I was at a coffee shop, telling customers. I was like, I'm one of those people now. I don't think the moon landings happened. And I was pretty, you know, depressed by the whole thing. And so I was still now kind of addicted to YouTube and flat earth conspiracy documentary kept popping up down there. And I was like, after seeing it constantly for three weeks, I was like, okay, I need something to cheer myself up. Like, <laughs> let's, let's see what this crazy guy is talking about. And I clicked on it and it was about two minutes into it where I was like, oh my gosh, I know what this guy's about to tell me for the next hour and a half. He's going to say satellites aren't real. Sea levels totally level. Nobody's ever been to space. Thrust isn't like possible in a vacuum using a conventional rocket motor. And sure enough, it was like boom, 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 boom. And so, as far as like figuring it out for myself, you know, I hadn't gone and done any testing or anything yet. But that was uh, that was my awesome awakening to flat Earth. Mm. And so, I. Uh, then started going back around to everybody. I was like, you know how last month I was telling you the moon landings were fake? Like, you have to look into this flat earth thing. Like, I'm telling you, like, I've been there, done that. You know, I was a really good student in high school. I went to, this is, I'm kind of mixing all kinds of stuff together. But, uh, you know, academically, I was, I was a pretty strong student. So I was at a, a large 5A high school here in Texas. And, uh, you know, senior year, I was, I think there was like a thousand people in my class. And by the time graduation came around, it was about 500, but I got voted most outstanding male student by the, you know, by my peers. And uh, as I said before, received a congressional nomination to go to West Point. And so by no stretch of the imagination, am I a genius or anything? But uh, I knew where I was at in regards to academic pursuits regard like uh, as I kind of stacked up next to everybody else. And so I was like, look guys, like I'm telling you, if you just look into this, you're going to conclude the same thing I did. Like I promise you stop, stop making fun of it. Look into this. And uh, you know, I'm not sure what to do with all this information, but I promise you this guy's definitely onto something. And so, you know, I probably watched the, the FD conspiracy doc, 500 times and I was, you know, I've got thousands of screenshots, of everything you put on there, sending it to all my my science friends. So uh, just to, to kind of give you some idea, too. So in 2008 and 2010, I did a couple of geologic drilling exploration or ex expeditions, I guess we could call them in uh, Yunnan province in southern China which ultimately resulted in getting acknowledged in the, the April uh, 
2012 edition of Nature. Mm. And uh, and so I was like, I know a lot of scientists, right? I know a lot of, uh, you know, I could be on the phone with one of the world's foremost geologists right now. I'd call him and he'd answer. And uh, so I'm texting this guy all kinds of stuff. And it seemed like he kind of half knew. And uh, where am I going with this? So the point is, I was pretty confident in in my my abilities to to do things. So I've been uh, self-employed for 20 years and been a general contractor for about 15 of it. So I own thousands of dollars worth of levels and lasers and all kinds of stuff. And it was like kind of the perfect guy to go out and start testing this stuff. Mm. And uh, so with that in mind, like uh, I felt like the flat earth conspiracy documentary because it was so good right it wasn't just like okay this is what you need to know it was a big you know who done it how did they do it are all these people colluding together all these various organizations and it was like whoa like i don't know that i can uh like you know, I was worried like the world was going to end, right? <laughs> you know, it was like, oh my gosh, it's all just going to collapse on itself. Mm. And uh, so as soon as 200 proofs came out, I was like, oh, Eric's reading my mind. This is <laughs> perfect. It's just straight back to the science. It's one, two, three, four, all the way through 200. And, you know, maybe you don't agree with every single one of those, but I promise you 195 of those at least are indisputable fact. And uh, so I've stuck with 200 proofs kind of because of its ease of marketability. It fits on windows. It's easy to remember. And especially given the nature of the topic, it's like, look, this isn't a belief. I'm not telling you to go open some 2000 year old book or anything. I'm saying like, look, the horizon's always at your eye level. Have you ever been in an airplane? This is not that difficult. Like if the horizon's at your eye level in an airplane, this is over. You have mm. not ascended above a convex object. Mm -hmm. And so I just have gotten kind of, so I just doubled down on 200 proofs and have, have kind of gone with that and have had a lot of success locally. So something, there was some switch that flipped here, like I'd say like six or eight months ago, where when, like when I first started doing what I was doing, which was like when I first started, it was, it was awful. It was ridiculous. You know, it was what you'd expect. And uh, so something six or eight months ago, something switched here. I don't know if it's everywhere or if it's just locally, but when I leave now, all I get is, you know, super excited honks, friendly mm. waves, people want to stop and chat. And so locally here, it's, it, it's you know, they're, they're selling flatter, like there's car magnets and stickers and they're selling the stuff at like, you know, the Denton Welcome Center, right? <laughs> So, that's pretty you cool. know, after a couple, oh, sorry. I said, yeah, that's pretty cool. So for the anyone listening here that uh, isn't familiar with what you've done, um, you're like, uh, you've, be you've become like a local celebrity to the point that you've got your, what is it, your house or your truck? Your truck uh, made it to a, a gift shop <laughs> because you've, uh, what you did is you took the flat earth message and made it mobile as well as advertised it on your house. So he's uh, put like ericdubay.com, 200 proofs, earth is flat, sea level is level, and all these flat earth catchphrases on his pickup truck and ridden all over the United States, as well as parked it on like four-way intersections so that uh, it's seen by as many people as possible. And then changing the messages on your house using your windows and your front lawn and getting creative, doing whatever you can to the point that I guess the uh, the local authority sent a, a letter to try and curb some of your activism, uh, maybe thought that uh, you'd gone too far, but then you found uh, ways to work within, you know, what was uh, the, their system so that you could still, th you know, have your messages on the windows, I guess, make them more portable or however that worked. Maybe you can uh, explain a bit of that to me. How did that get started? And how how is that now? Had you ever done activism of that type before Flat Earth, or did Flat Earth no, kick, kick, no, no, that kick started no. all of this? Right? Yeah, yeah, no. So, uh, so uh, again, when I came across Flat Earth conspiracy documentary, I think maybe like ten or thirteen thousand people had seen the video, and and I was like, 
you know, some of the things you relate in there, which is like, look, I've received numerous death threats and all this stuff. And it was like, oh, man, this guy needs some help. You know, we, we got to get this out or this this is going to go away and nobody's going to figure it out. And so, you know, I was like uh, I was extremely motivated to, to try and do something. And uh, I started just kind of trying to think through fundamentals and basics like, OK, is the pen mightier than the sword? If you want to change the world, start at home, yada, yada, yada. And so what I ultimately landed on, you know, like money was and is still extremely, you know, pretty tight. And so I was trying to figure out something that I could do that was affordable and sustainable and also wasn't going to like wreck me too bad emotionally. Right. And because uh, absorbing that amount of ignorance and hate from the general public is uh, it's pretty intense. Right. And uh, especially somebody with my background, you know, like uh, played a lot of contact sports, district champ wrestler, you know, somebody comes at me too crazy and I'll flip a switch and just, you know, do something nobody likes. And so it was like, OK, I need to really, you know, at least at the time, you know, since since going vegan and practicing, you know, breathing exercises and doing all these things that uh, you've recommended over the years. I've seen wild success mm. uh, in the ability to, to control my mood and, and thought processes. Mm. But uh, basically, I landed on chalk markers. I was like, OK, I'm on my own property and free speech is technically legal. I understand like you know, there's nothing free about free speech. You know, I've been drugged to court so many times at this point for using chalk, right? On my own property. Wow. It's ridiculous. Right? I was even convicted the first time before I started really figuring it out of what did they get me for? Not filing a building permit. Mm. A building permit. I was using a chalk marker and somehow like a jury of my peers, you know, concluded that I, I, for some reason, needed to get permission and pay for free speech on my own property that consisted of using chalk markers wow. that somehow required a building permit. Mm. You know, and it was like, look, guys, I'm a contractor. I pulled building permits. There's nothing about a chalk marker that, that I don't need a building inspection. I don't need anybody's permission. We're in the United States. Like, I have a right to do this. Right. And, uh, it, you know, it fell on deaf ears. And then I got a little bit more savvy about, you know, concocting legal arguments and putting motions to dismiss together and the whole nine yards. But, uh, yeah, so ultimately I landed on chalk markers and just tried to get uh, as creative as I could. And, and what I liked about, like, as opposed to... It, as opposed to sitting at a table and trying to do one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, for me, my personality that wasn't wasn't really going to work at the time. So I've had a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, like you know, hundreds of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people at this point. Uh, but using kind of a passive approach to activism, right? Being like, okay, focus on the car, focus on the house, try and focus on the message, as as opposed to focusing on the personality or the person uh was was really good for me and uh so yeah it's, it's that it was the basic approach right was trying to figure out what i could do that was affordable and effective so when i ultimately finished college i was a marketing major and uh and it was like okay let's just apply some really basic marketing fundamentals to this which is consistency a theme you know like saturate the market uh you know draw attention to it um, you know, there's a lot of competition for, for people's attention. And uh, so it was like, OK, let's use vibrant colors. Let's, you know, change it up some, but not too much. Let's uh, and stick with the most important stuff and try and stick to just facts. Right. It was in my mind. It was like, nope, don't put your opinion about anything. Just facts like. You know, and then even the definition of what is and isn't a fact, obviously, people argue about. But uh, that, that was the basic gist of it. And so my approach was to, to try and just troll the heck out of campus, right? Just keep driving through campus, have 200 proofs on everything, Eric Dubay on everything, because the, the, the censorship just, like, I, I, 
I wasn't sure that I could trust any of the metrics that I was seeing from YouTube, from, from any of these video sharing platforms. And so I felt like the safest bet was to, to just ericdubay.com. I'm not sure how long you've had that, that website up, but uh, the, it seemed like the best way, given all of the uh, people associated, not all the people, uh, but given the people that I feel are trying to very obviously co-opt the movement, right? Uh, that, that trying to, to fight that as hard as I could by just pushing your work was was the, the best bet, right? Because, uh, yeah. And so the other day when, when you hit a million minds open on ericdubay.com, I was pretty excited. It was like, okay, this has been a long time coming. And to me, that was a good indication that, okay, hopefully like hundreds of thousands of people at least have, have found and seen 200 proofs and that there's a reasonable conversation going on in the academic halls <laughs> and uh, that, that, that we've actually made some made some progress. And so I know I saw Planet Plane, I guess. I'm not sure exactly what, what their deal is, but it seems like they're of the same ilk or mindset I am of your work. And so I, I loved what he did the, I don't know how long it's been, maybe it's been a couple of years, but I guess definitely he's had a million views on 200 proofs on that channel. And uh, to me, that just seems like the way to go, right? Until basically people are watching that, in, you know, until that's like standard material in like third grade, right? We're not done, mm. right? Like the, the idea that uh, like the level of nonsense that's being taught to kids these days is like, it's beyond comprehension, right? For, for people not to believe that like sea levels actually level Mm -hmm. like is is amazing yeah. level and, means curved yeah they're, they're redefining like, words so that it fits with their science fiction narrative that everyone believes now just keeps going like that so yeah just saying something uh you know a tantamount phrase like sea level is level what a <laughs> what a you know whoa, whoa. Really <laughs> yeah <laughs> such such a debatable subject <laughs> similar to like you know a man is a male and a um, female is a female it's like that's really debatable in 2023 let's not go there you know they've made it so that so many things that should be clear to anyone um are now so hazy that you can make a whole documentary called what is a woman and have the leading gender experts not be able to define that simple thing and uh similar with the experts of astronomy and geology and geography and and everyone else who's supposed to know what this earth is and everything beyond it yet we're finding you know the same thing there it's mostly just a bunch of imaginative theories that have taken over people's minds to the point that when you bring actual empirical proof and direct realism to the argument you're seen as the crazy person. When you'd bring actual scientific experiments to the realm of science, the scientists are like, what is he doing? I thought we were just gonna theorize in a, in a room here and, and bounce ideas off each other. He's actually bringing uh, levels and theodolites and sextants and measurements to the, the table here. What are we gonna do? Let's redefine what level means. Good call. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> you know, it's like, really, that's where y'all are at. But yeah, you, know, you couldn't be more correct. You know, like I said earlier, I've definitely been around a lot of uh, a lot of professional scientists. And, uh, you know, that, that is entirely the case in my experience. So when I still was totally on board with the space thing, I think maybe it was 2011 or 12, this guy, John Grotzinger, was doing a talk out in California, and he was the uh, the lead scientist for the the Mars rover Curiosity mission. And you know, I was so into it, I was convinced that this guy was going to be credited as the first scientist with you know discovering life on on another planet. And I was like, oh man, I've got a week. I can make it out there, go to this thing. I'll be able to shake this guy's hand, meet him, and just check a box. You know, like I actually shook the hand of the guy who discovered life on Mars. Mm. And, uh, and so I get out there to this talk and, and after it's over, you know, I asked him, 
I was like, what are your thoughts on, you know, the, like, was there an independent genesis of life on Earth and Mars, or did life start on Mars? And he, he kind of looked at me and smiled and laughed and told me something I just didn't expect to hear out of, out of the guy who's the lead scientist for the Curiosity Project, like, at all. He was like, Patrick, life definitely started here on Earth on its own. And I was like, what? I, I just didn't, ex you know, because the, the, the concept that they were pushing at the time was this whole panspermia, an asteroid hit Mars and knocked bacterial life onto an asteroid that then landed on Earth and seeded life here. And that was definitely what was being pushed on television and through NASA and everything at the time. And so John was like, the point is it stuck with me. And, mm. and I was like, why did that guy say that? And then... You know, a couple of years later, I came across the moon landing stuff and then obviously your work and was like, oh, because that guy was already well aware of all this. Hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, the the where science and mainstream science is at now is it's it's pretty embarrassing. Right. right? So these people are really good at talking and they're, they're really good at uh, sophistry and, you know, everything you need to do to sell like a big lie to people that aren't really paying attention and want to be entertained and bamboozled, but they're definitely not doing real science. Right. right? And, uh, that's, uh, it's pretty upsetting when you're the kind of person that bought into it hook, line and sinker the whole time you were growing up where you wanted to, you know, and actually took it as far as to attend West point because you wanted to be an astronaut at some point, you were trying to keep your options open and uh, you find out, no, that's all just nonsense. And it's like, okay, but what's cool about the situation now is, and my hope is that ultimately, you know, if, if the Weiss crew doesn't sink their, like doesn't delude everybody into entertainment and nonsense, that the, the unifying factor in the flat earth movement will be, you know, to demand independent and complete exploration. And so the whole idea that exploration is still completely on the table is uh, is pretty exciting to me. And so I'm not sure whether or not uh, heading north or south would be more attainable faster. But uh, I, I'd like to think here in the next like three to five years, there will be some sort of serious effort to, to do some exploration. Right. And so I'm not sure... You know, who, like, who knows? I just want to know where we're at. You know, if this whole thing is really in a dome, like, so be it. You know, I, I like it. And I think there's definitely natural physical processes that could explain how a dome would be formed over the Earth. Right. Uh, being that if, you know, the sun's making these circles over us every day that when you get far enough away from it and if things are layered in, in different, you know, density layering, right? In my mind, there should be like way up there some super cooled layer of, you know, hydrogen or helium and then maybe on top of that hydrogen. But I don't know what happens when those two gases hit like an absolute zero. Do they solidify? Are we getting super fluids that are really conductive? Like who knows what's going on? That's why this whole exploration thing is, uh, is pretty key. And then when I go back and I watched Admiral Byrd on the, the Long Jeans Chronicles, it's, you know, I understand he was a Mason and all this stuff, but watching him on television slip that in and say, like, look, beyond Antarctica, there's another continent the size of America or something to, to that effect was like, ooh, seems like maybe he just snuck one in for everybody saying, like, there's, you know, there, there's still more to explore. And mm -hmm. so who knows, maybe it was all acting or whatever, but uh, to me, he seems to be the only person in history that was actually in a position to, to do what he was saying, mm. right? He had the full backing of the military, you know, icebreakers and helicopters and airplanes and everything you need, you know, resupply lines to actually do it. Uh, you know, obviously I don't buy his North Pole exploration thing. I'm not sure what happened there, but, uh, you know. I, yeah, again, I really hope that uh, independent or free and unrestricted exploration is, is ultimately what unites the movement, because otherwise it's going to be a bunch of people at some flat earth conference listening to 
nonsense, getting drunk. Like, you know, I'm not against having fun, right? I was, I was a two-time rush chair, like, when I was in school. Like, I love a good party. But uh, that's not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about, like, things that affect everybody. And uh, to me, I get particularly frustrated with the people that are in charge uh, of that conference because, I, to me, they're just trying to... To me, they're just trying to steal your work, right? It's like you go and watch some of these chats and how much money some of these people are making and the number of people that are involved in it now and the idea that you just started taking, you know, donations the other day. Uh, God bless you, man. You know, way, way to do it. And so <laughs> it uh, giving all your books away for free. Like, so we're doing good, man. We're caught up on the books. And, uh <laughs> Glad to have, you know, glad to have actually paid for some at this point. Um, and uh, I, because they, yeah, they, they've changed my life, right? And uh, I genuinely appreciate it. So I appreciate thank you that, so much. <laughs> Thanks. I, it's a, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know how you do it. it it's amazing. So I've wanted to, to I've wanted to separate myself from those people as well, um, both in my work as well as you know, the impetus for doing it, I could see that it seemed like a lot of people were jumping on it as a money train and they're just seeing that, oh, this is trending, especially back 2015 when when I have I would say I made it a trending topic. And then everyone else yeah, just did. <laughs> they had jumped on board and, you know, the Patreons and the conferences and, you know, don't donate to me and uh, pay for this paywall and, and all of these kind of things. And often they would come with my work and even more aggravating with the anti flat earthers who will just take my work and then intersperse some like, -uh, <laughs> that's crazy, laughing at me, and <laughs> you know, spouting their globe earth rhetoric or whatever in between it. And then they're making all these, you know, all this money as well as YouTube favoring them and the algorithm so that I'd put out a video, you know, barely get any views on it. And then these anti flat earthers who are pushed in the YouTube algorithm are getting hundreds of thousands of views, basically just pushing my video, but with their their little uh -uh clips interspersed. But <laughs> I let that go on and I was invited to the conferences and, the, and I didn't want to participate or be associated with them. And as I've said before, like people always say how the truth should be free and, and all that. And in some ways I agree. And I saw it as a red flag when truthers are trying to make money off of what they're doing. So I spent basically the last 15 years doing it for free, giving everything away for free. And the only real way that I was getting remuneration was if people bought physical copies of my books. And that's kept me in starving artist mode for a long time, long enough that I was able to release eight books and, um, you know, still not have uh, <laughs> anything to my name. I'm back back here now at home in Maine and, uh, you know, it's humbling, but I'm glad to be here back with family and everything. Had a great experience over there in Thailand. Um, and so, yeah, I did uh, recently start accepting donations uh, because, you know, if I'm going to make it, especially here in the States, you know, things are a lot more expensive here. And um, and so I've just, you know, I, I hope I, people can still differentiate between me and some of the other people maybe who it seems like they're doing it for the money and everything is just about how they can rake in more money and the truth is just kind of on the sidelines. It's like, that's their shtick. Whereas for me, the truth is my life. This has always been, I've always, I've just been a researcher. I've been obsessed with finding the truth about everything in life. It's not just flat earth or whatever. I'm into a lot of other subjects as you know, and people who've read my books and seen my videos know, I just, I'm obsessed with truth basically. Uh, I'm a very honest person as well. I'm obsessed with integrity and trying to maintain my own at all costs so truth is just like a it's really important to me and so i hope that people see that the fact that i am taking donations now uh it's not <laughs> truth is still the main thing to me but and you need 
a way to focus on that. Otherwise, I have to get a full time job now. And there's, you know, you barely hear from me. Basically, it's up to the, you know, it's up to the will of the people at, at that point. Um, but so far, the will has spoken and people are, have generously um, um, subscribed to Patreon. And I think between book sales and, and the pledges that have been made, I should be able to make it work for now. I'm absolutely going to continue as I've been doing and hope that I <laughs> can continue that way. And like I said, hope that people can still see the difference between me and maybe some of the other characters in here that I don't see as having the same level of integrity or genuineness in their mission. Well, what you're you're up to you've got 190,000 subs on YouTube now. Yep. Yeah. So I'm hoping the uh, the Patreon thing will will start to to move a little closer in that direction. Uh, you know, we're we're still so anybody watching this, you know, five bucks a month, we're talking 60 bucks a year to help Eric, like, be Eric. Like, <laughs> it's so worth five dollars, like, get real, you know. So, you know, think about it, please uh, help this guy out. So the conference was weird. So we get there and this Jimmy Kimmel guy basically pretends like my vehicle's his. Like, you know, I don't, you know, like some of this stuff is ridiculous. It's meant to kind of make people laugh out of the gates because mm. of the nature of the, like the subject is so serious that it's like, you know, I laughed, you know, as I said earlier, when I saw Flat Earth Consu Conspiracy Documentary pop up on the YouTube thing, I was like, ha ha ha, oh sure, oh sure. And so I think that was kind of good for me mentally as I was going through the psychology of like, how do I present this information to other people? Like, I want you to have a laugh, but when you decide to look into it, I want you starting with the best information. And so again, that's why I've always push 200 proofs and just still stick to it. Um, but uh, yeah, so this guy basically pretended to be me. And then, I don't know. It's like, you know, I've been impersonated like you. I've received numerous death threats. Uh, you know, oh my gosh, I'm probably one of the most flipped off people in America at this point. Um, not again anymore, but when this started, holy moly, it was, you know, sometimes five, ten times a day. It was pretty intense, but, you know, I was out asking for it, I guess, to some degree. Um, and uh, so, yeah, back to the whole conference thing. Uh, I get impersonated there. That was not off to a good start. And then it became real clear to me on the second day of it that, okay, Weiss is actually running this thing. Right. This is this whole thing is just a big marketing ploy for him to sell, you know, like uh, like the, the three dollar at a time app thing and just kind of slowly take over this movement. So 10 years from now, when everybody knows Earth's flat and motionless, like this guy's going to have total control via his app over all the information that these people are seeing. And it's just going to be history repeating itself. It's going to be like that guy and his group of people in charge of the information watering it down and we're not going to make any real progress and so day two of the conference like i said i show up somebody tries to impersonate me i'm still reeling from having the house vandalized you know like thousands of dollars worth of damage like uh, i'm a contractor so i was able to handle it but still it's just irritating um and and then i see you know it's real obvious weiss is running this thing and he's spending thousands of dollars to to fly planes over this thing you can't even read what's on them and it's like dude what is going on and later in the day he's like we're gonna go do activism and then he corrals like two or three hundred people and and takes them to do you know i'd already been in this game what like hardcore for three years at this point right so you know like out out in it right not not like uh, like there was a, again your content's so good I saw no reason for me to even try and make my own content, right? I, I know that's where some people's creative abilities lead them and God bless them. You know, like if you're you're being legit, like Amish, you know, like he's still crushing it. Like everybody you've done one of these podcasts with have been, I've related to and, and felt like, you know, I feel kin to them, right? And uh, so so good on you for your judge of character and your ability to, to see what's going on with people. But uh, Weiss, corrals like 300 of us and then we go over to like this mall that's across the street from the thing and we've got 300 people that have never tried activism on their own with weiss leading all the sheep you know and then everybody's walking through this mall being like Bruh! and what do you know we get kicked out eight minutes later you know mm -hmm. and so i'm i'm looking at this like 
what what was that? That was the mm. worst approach I've ever seen, ever. You know, like, and you just basically told 300 people, like, activism's not worth it. Don't waste your time. You're just going to get, like, sent packing instantly. And I was like, you just you just killed 300 people that were, had, they had some decent instruction on how to approach activism. You know, they would have been, the, the army would have been that much bigger, right? But you just, you just ruined it. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, it was pretty much a weekend of that. And I left being like, what was that? You know, you know, he was really nice in person and all this stuff. Right. But you're like, well, what was the net effect of this guy being involved? And and my conclusion was like, yeah, it definitely wasn't positive. It was basically what Eric concluded is this guy is totally trying to co-opt it. He's trying to slip in misinformation. And I'm at a flat earth conference and literally the most taboo thing you could do there is say your name. Right. I was like, Eric's not here. And literally like, Everybody knows because of my vehicles, like, you know, and I was, uh, you know, I had, had had the vehicles at this conference, right? Like, they knew darn sure where I stood on the whole thing. And uh, and I'm just looking around like, what is this? It's like, we can't even give the guy that had the balls to, like, put this information out there. Not just the balls, but the genius to be able to, to package it in a way and, and to sneak it through, like, and, and actually get it out there in, in an effective way, like, we, we're not even allowed to say his name at this damn conference. Mm-hmm. Like, what is going on here, guys? You know, you're charging hundred like you know, to like anybody that's going to go do that. Like again, like I, you know, if you're going to go to one of those things, like don't buy a ticket. Just go stand in the lobby and hang out with everybody. There's no need to go in there and listen to these people that like may or may not have decent information. But as far as that went, like it was nice being around like hundreds of people that were aware of the same information you are Mm -hmm. you know i I gotta give them that right but uh like yeah please don't give them money like if you're gonna do anything like send it to eric like i promise you whatever he comes up with however he's gonna decide to to use that money it's it's gonna be better than what they came up with i promise you right Mm -hmm. so whether or not it it continues to write books continues to do video like whatever he comes up with like that's the place to send it and uh, so, yeah, sorry, I apologize. But like like you said, I think that if there's anything that we all as flat earthers, globe earthers, people who don't even care, earthers uh, could come together with is the idea of full exploration or just freedom. The idea of, did, did you know we can't go straight in an airplane for 24 hours? Like, well, that's how enslaved we are. That That is not acceptable they say that in history circumnavigation happened and allegedly that was done in a straight line you just went in a straight line and and you came right back to your starting point magellan and everyone since then that's how it happened that's how they teach the school kids you just go in a straight line and because it's a globe you come right back where you started from wow but then you look into it and as an adult and you think about it that's not how any circumnavigations in history have ever gone whether they be by sea or air they travel in basically straight lines from port to port until they make a circle around the earth. And that's not going straight 24 hours. If you did go straight, no matter what direction you started or where you you were, as long as you stayed in a perfectly straight line, you end up in Antarctica. I say. The globe earthers and their priests and everything say that you're going to come back around to your starting point. Why can't we see? I think that should be the biggest thing ever. You know, if not an exodus to Antarctica or the North Pole, like you said, at least let's go, you know, we got to go at least, how fast? At least about 500, 600 miles per hour, but 24 hours, or we could go 48 hours, you know, let's go further. But point being is that we're not allowed past the 60th South Parallel as an independent explorer. You need military confirmation. You need government approval. You can only go on a little penguin tour to Antarctica if you want to. Other than that, if you think about actual full exploration like we're talking about, you're going to get turned around by military like people who have actually tried this uh, throughout uh, past decades have had happened to them. So this is a real thing. You can't just go out there on your little skipper and, and make this happen. 
we need to make a mass movement. We need to have people come together, at least in mind and heart, understand that we are enslaved to the point that they won't allow us to go in a straight line for 24 hours. We're in a very small dish here, in a little Petri dish, and we don't even know if there's a, a wall that encloses us in it, or if there's whole other worlds or an infinite plane beyond us that, you know, who knows what's out there. We are, what they're telling us is we're on this globe, the perfect shape to eliminate any extra land that may exist beyond Antarctica because you close it off. You turn from Antarctica being the elevated rim that holds the oceans in and all of the other continents, it becomes just this tiny ice continent on the bottom of a globe that nobody can really go to or beyond anyway, theoretically. And then physically, they've got to, with the Antarctic Treaty, they've got us not allowed to. And then with the globe cosmology, they got everyone thinking, well, we want to go to Mars and we want to go off world to all these other imaginative places that don't even really exist versus something that absolutely exists, Antarctica, but we don't know how it terminates. We don't know how far it goes. Like you said, Admiral Byrd, the only real eyewitness we have, snuck it in on television that, uh, well, what I saw was a continent the size of America uh, on the other side of Antarctica. So he's saying that there's way more land over there that was untouched by human hands, as far as he, he's concerned. And who knows, but don't we want to know? Don't people yeah. want to know? Don't you globe earthers who are so, um, you know, adamant that the earth is as Neil deGrasse Tyson claims and, and NASA and all these other people, why, why don't you want to laugh in the flat earther's face and have a live streamed 24 hour straight flight or, you know, or multiple? What I would like to see is the end of my children's book happen where everybody gets together, the military stands down for, for a day we all understand that this is a thing that's going to happen for humanity and all people with their independent planes get your Cessnas and, 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 you know, independent pilots and everyone with your boats, anyone that has the capability to go to Antarctica or to the North Pole and has the will to do it all at once, live stream. It would be the most exciting and um, influential thing in human history, you know, at least for the many centuries because this deception truly is the biggest deception in human history it's been going on for arguably 500 or so years now and it's gotten to the point especially since nasa that it's it was absolutely successful until about 2014 you know 99.999 percent of humanity was in this globe earth evolution big bang religion even people that believe in Christianity or other religions were even trying to work it in. They're trying to make evolution and globe and Big Bang work. Well, the God is the first cause, and he made the Big Bang, and 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 he, he made evolution happen. And so they were so successful in this science fiction that even people in completely other realms of thought were trying to incorporate it into it. I don't know if it's like low IQ, low self-esteem. I'm not sure what's going on with these people, right? But it's like, okay, y'all are just like kind of toxic. Like, yeah. whoa, you know, I'm over here trying to like, you know, I had a couple of big glasses of juice this morning, getting ready to talk to Eric. Like, <laughs> you know, been doing the vegan thing for a few years and it's been treating me really well. So thank you for that. Uh, Curious to but hear yeah, about I'm that. Sure. As well as What's that? I'm, curi I'm curious to hear about that. As well as you said, you've been doing uh, breathing exercises as well. Yeah, I mean, not what I should be, not remotely what you're doing, right? But for me, it uh, you know, I used to be a pretty pretty big health nut and and have been in extremely good shape for periods of time, several times throughout my life, and. It, uh, you know, I was, I was one of the worst, man. When you came out with that vegan video, I was like, well, Eric, you're still going to be, you know, running into mosquitoes when they take the soybeans to the, you know, whatever, you know, just totally missing the point, right? Could not have been more missing what you were trying to express, which is like, look, man, you need to, you need to dial into your higher self, right? If you can walk around and, and have the, uh, what was that video you liked recently? The guy said, 
you know, have the moral authority to, 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 to do what you know is right, right? To really try and lean into to, to, to cleansing your body, right? And so I still consume all kinds of toxins and stuff, but it, the, the vegan thing has been just a huge life hack for me, right? And so I was worried at first, every, you know, I was telling my buddies here that are flat earthers in town, I was like, dude, I'm gonna do it. You know, so I, I, I kind of dipped my toe in the water and started cutting out all the meats and then was vegetarian for a couple of years. And then was like, what was it? Oh yeah, it was, I guess, March of 2020 was when I was out on a road trip and I was like, I just found myself like pulling over to grocery stores and buying like bags of mandarins and grapes and lots of fruits and, you know, bananas. And I was like, I haven't had any animal products in a week. I've just been out driving and, and my, my thoughts became so clear and I felt so good and, and my body mass was down, you know, I was like rocking a six pack and I was like, geez, I'm not even like exercising hard. You know, I used to be really into weightlifting and, and all kinds of stuff. And it was like, oh my gosh, this just simplifies everything so much. And it's like just running so much cleaner and feeling so much more, uh, you know, it's nice when you walk around and, and you're worried about, not worried, but you're you're conscious and considerate of all the, you know, all creatures great and small, right? And it's like, I just wasn't convinced out of the gates because I heard all this, oh, you're not going to get your B12 and, you know, just all the, the typical arguments. And it was like, as soon as I really started practicing it, it like, it was like, what are you talking about? You know, it was like, this is, this is obviously the you know, I've, I've done a, every extreme diet there's ever been, right? I've tried it at least once. And, uh, and I kind of had my own thing figured out for trying to maintain my muscle mass and do my thing. And it was like, okay, if I can transition into this vegan thing and then, you know, I, I know raw is the way to do it, right? But, you know, I still use like, you know, I still eat a lot of tofu. Like I'll go through phases with different products, right? And so now it's become, especially being in a city, it's so easy to do. The grocery store is like, you know, I can pick up 25 pounds of carrots when I get on like a juicing kick for 10 bucks, you know, and, and, you know, if I'm feeling inflamed or like whatever, like the juice to me is just, it's a miracle cure. Right. And so when I started getting into it, there was this lady, Lorraine Day, I mm. guess she's coming at it from like a, she like, like a biblical kind of thing, but she was this really well-trained super credentialed like ER doctor or something in San Francisco for like four decades, right? She was like the head of the the surgical department, like this lady knew what she was talking about. And she came down with like a, a tumor that, that she said within a month had grown, you know, to the size of like a cantaloupe, like right there. And so she was like, I'm gonna go down the hall and talk to the oncologist who I've known. And I know what he's gonna tell me, which is we're gonna cut this thing open and uh and then you know i'm gonna be dead right it's gonna start you know getting the lymph system and and it's gonna be over and so she was like okay i turned to the bible and it, you know basically what she concluded was yeah this thing says like eat you know the fruits and vegetables and everything that's green is there for you and so she did that and basically arrived after talking to the oncologist like okay what i'm gonna do is juice fast for a month and all i'm gonna all i'm gonna drink or all i'm gonna consume is carrot juice for a month and she said she did that and then just watched this tumor just shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. And I think I came across her on, on a coast to coast. She was talking to Art Bell, I think, if I remember correctly. That was the interview I saw her on. And so I was like, oh, man, I need to get a juicer. So my girlfriend and I, we got on Craigslist and got a couple of juicers, just picked up. like. Uh, so anybody listening, the, I got like a Jack Lane juicer on Craigslist for like 50 bucks. And I've had it for three or four years now. And oh, it's better than any pharmacy, I promise you. All right, if you're suffering from anything, just start juicing. You know, just stop eating all the other nonsense and just put down the juice for three or four days. And I promise you, whatever it is, you're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. Like, not just better, you're going to feel amazing. And so that was kind of my plan this week before I talked to you is just to <laughs> fully go into the juice thing. But stuff came up on a job. And so I kind of didn't get a carry through with that, but I definitely started, you know, yesterday afternoon and then this morning. And so I'm feeling pretty good right now, but 
anybody that's wondering, you know, if you're if you're achy, if you're hurting, you know, I, it, it is a miracle cure. It's just you can sit there and just drink liquid sunshine, and it, oh my gosh, it, it'll make you know, it, it'll make you feel so much better. And so, huge fan of this whole whole vegan diet, you know, and and. and like you, I'm not sure I'd have to be in a situation where it was like impossible, you know, so, but I, you know, I, I don't have any of that, you know, I, you know, I grew up hunting and fishing and all kinds of stuff. Right. And so it was like, it never really particularly enjoyed it, you know, kind of saw it for what it was, but it was like, okay, if I'm going to go eat a cheeseburger, I need to understand like this process, you know, I'm not going to let somebody else do that for me. Like, uh, you know, I, I want to know, you know, it was like every time it was like, this is, this seems messed up. You know, it was like, I understand this is part of the culture and that, you know, and like far, you know, if you're up north, I understand how like, you know, Eskimo tribes and stuff like there, there's maybe no way around it. Right. But if you're anywhere like near the tropics, if you're anywhere like in the south, like especially if you're anywhere in like a major city, it's just too easy not to. You know, it's like at least give it a try. Right. Mm. And so my girlfriend, she's been vegetarian for I guess five or six years now. She started about the same time I did, so she hasn't gone the, the the full vegan thing yet. But we'll see if she does eventually. But she does a vegetarian thing, and it treats her really well. And she's able to like you know keep, keep her complexion is great, and she's you know stays young looking and is vibrant and all of it. And so it uh, yeah, man, thank you because I promise you, I was in your comment section being like, what are you talking? You took it too far this time, Merrick. You know, I was like, there's no way around it. You know, it was like okay, what I need to do is actually just try this before I knock it. And sure enough, Eric researched the heck out of something, put it into practice and got the word out. And so, yes, again, thank you. Oh, but, thanks, man. Yeah, I, that was yeah. A, a mission even before Flat Earth because I went vegan around 20, 2007 or so. And um, it's been, a, you know, it was a big boon in my life as well that's i'm promoting it both for the health of the people who can um, live it as well as the health of the animals that can be saved from it it was a win-win it still is a win-win situation when people do it correctly and figure it out um, problem is yeah there are ways to do it incorrectly there are a lot of vegan junk foods and you know more and more so now as they're coming out with it to the point that people think that veganism is the nwo diet and they're they're trying to push so that everyone eats uh vegan which is again i see as completely the opposite rather there was a genuine vegan movement grassroots going similar to the flat earth and they jumped on board it with their controlled opposition so that they can make money similarly so now you've got all of these vegan uh, burgers and and meats and cheeses and and other unhealthy options that they're making money on this new sector of the market that opened up and they're also bringing us right back into the fold by being unhealthy again and some of them even slipping non-vegan ingredients into their so supposedly vegan products that has happened as well really yeah <laughs> in thailand we've found that uh, a few times um so I don't see, you know, what do you see every commercial? Uh, you know, you don't see commercials for broccoli and, and lemons and, <laughs> and strawberries. You see commercials for meat and cheese and dairy and, and, and you know, fast food and the, the things that are being promoted. Um, uh, but for, you know, for me, I was the same way. Growing up, it always felt uncompassionate, uh, you know, it's empathetic towards the animals and it just felt like really we have to do this i knew that vegetarians existed you know i've heard the word vegan but you also hear alongside that that it's unhealthy and they're gonna be skinny and all this stuff and look at me my whole life i've been a skinny tall lanky guy trying to put on weight you know eating i used to i at one point i would eat six meals a day and weight lift every day trying to put on weight until I got myself sick. Uh, I got myself so sick that I lost all the weight that I'd gained and I had to change my diet. I couldn't eat that way anymore. Otherwise I would continue getting strep throat and sore throats and over and over again to the point that my throat would close up and I couldn't, couldn't swallow anymore. My body was 
physically telling me, <laughs> you know, you, oh, you're not, yeah. you can't do that. Stop it. Yeah. Um, and it, it got to the point that, you know, just swallowing phlegm every minute or two, like you have to, I would sh shake like that just from the pain of, of it. And so I was getting these sore throats from pushing too much meat, eggs, cheese, all the stuff you're supposed to eat when you're a tall, skinny, lanky guy like me that wants to put on muscle and, and look, you know, better, whatever. But what I've found over now 15, going on 16 years vegan, I still uh, lift weights occasionally and, and I do martial arts and everything. My weight has stayed the same. I mean, the, ever, ever since I lost that weight, I was able to put on a bit of mass when I was eating six meals a day of all that crap that I made myself sick with. So I'll admit that, yeah, okay, if, if you're willing to put in all that crap, and most people do even more, they do the creatine and the whey protein and all these other supplements oh, yeah. to, to pack <laughs> it on, and none of those are good for you. It's I'm all, sure not. It's all <laughs> terrible for your health, but what it will do is uh, pack on mass. And that's what bodybuilders want is and it's any mass it doesn't it often doesn't even look very good it's puffy muscle it's not cut lean muscle which is what you actually want um so i have cut all of it out eventually i found out vegetarian vegetarianism and veganism for me it was a real slow shift though i started by just um well i stopped eating six meals a day i just went back to eating normally and then I started cutting out coffee and soda to begin with, because those were the first things that I knew that I drank excessively that I could stop and should stop because they have drug-like effects. And when I stopped drinking coffee every morning, I mean, man, I had headaches for a week. It was rough. Um, so you, you have literal withdrawal symptoms. Um, oh, and then when I tried coffee again years later after being off of it, I had a Starbucks one day just to, to try it. I had the shakes, was sweating, my my hands were like this, my heart was racing for hours. It was not an enjoyable experience. I couldn't imagine wanting to do that daily. Um, but your body gets used to it. If you do do that daily, you're not really going to notice. You might notice that if you are tired, you, you perk up a little bit, but not to the degree I noticed. I mean, I'm sensitive, and the more you work on your body in, in these things, the more sensitive you become when you when you go off the deep end like that, where I just... Oh, I'll have a large Starbucks just out of the blue because I do that. Like I think you've probably heard me talk about before. I I don't like to go 100% black and white with anything. I like to always kind of stay at a, a light shade of gray where I allow myself to spoil myself once in a while for something or um, even like I've said with raw veganism, like I know what the top of the mountain is for, you know, how you should eat. And it's basically you eat raw fruit, a little bit of vegetables, a little bit of nuts and seeds and sprouts, and that's about it. If you could limit yourself to that, you would be as healthy as possible. And I've done that for months at a time, and I have so much energy that I have trouble sleeping at night and just doing my very sedentary lifestyle where I make videos and research and all this kind of stuff. It's not very active, but man, if you're just eating fruit all day and raw veggies and everything you just have so much energy um so i i still eat a high raw high carb low fat uh, vegan diet but not an all raw it's just too much i don't even necessarily recommend that unless you're a, a super active lifestyle for most people i would say that's just a bit too much you're you're brimming with with energy Though for um, healing, as a healing modality, fasting, whether it's water fasting or juice fasting, like you said, is amazing for anything. Any ailment you've got, whenever you're feeling run down or you've, you've you know, stomach ache, headache, sore throat, you name, or to the, to the big degenerative chronic illnesses like um, uh, cancer and, and diabetes even, you can reverse diabetes with a, a vegan diet, fruit heavy. People think that fruit is what made them diabetic. That's not how it works. You, people get diabetes because the their cells become lined with lipid with fat, so that the sugars from the natural fruit sugars and glucose and fructose can't get into your cells and feed them. So it stays in your bloodstream, and your blood sugar spikes, and you have to create insulin to deal with it, and then you become diabetic. 
but it, and you blame the fruit <laughs> fruit, <laughs> fruit is the savior the reason most diabetics are obese uh, uh, you know completely overweight is because they became diabetic through an overconsumption of fat and that's what's being pushed you talk about veganism is the nwo diet it's being pushed no you know what's always being pushed fat they always push high fat diets whether they call it keto paleo primal uh low carb because anything that's low carb is high fat it's it's basically one or the other and what i've been you know i've tried both a high carb diet is more conducive to health than a high fat diet when you put your body in the state of ketosis because you don't eat enough carbohydrates to burn that kind of fuel and you have to burn fat all the time because that's all you're ever eating that's an emergency state of being that your body goes into like a bear in hibernation when he's not eating anything so that you can eat off your fat reserves. So it's it's like going up in a plane and only using your reserve tank and just being like, let's, let's leave the main tank alone. Let's let's use the reserve tank all the time and call that healthy and call it a, a, a solution for problems. And now they're doing the carnivore diet, which for some people with real digestive issues, they can find slight relief for a while because there's no fiber in the diet. So if you're, you know, all fiber comes from plant foods and all animal foods are devoid of fiber. And that's what ha that's why people who are on a carnivore diet or on a high fat or high meat and dairy diet have constipation and trouble in that department. Whereas if you go vegan, you're probably gonna find yourself uh, on the toilet every morning or, you know, at, at least or maybe a couple times, uh, if you really get your system the way it should be, it's shortly after every meal. You got to get rid of whatever that last meal was, as long as you're not eating, you know, four or five, six times a day. But, uh, you know, I, I, I've gone on stints where I just eat one meal a day. It's leveled out to I, I eat about one and a half meals a day, which is what I think is about proper for um, human consumption. This three meals a day and breakfast is the most important meal of the day thing with the with the food pyramid with sweets at the top and and uh, breads and grains at the bottom filling up the the biggest amount these are, this is terrible health advice uh you don't need to eat first thing in the morning unless you're truly hungry if you feel like you're still kind of full over from the the last meal especially if you haven't even taken a trip to the bathroom yet you don't need to heap on more food in the gut right now you need you want to have a, a nice area of time every day where it feels like you got a flat tummy there's nothing in there you get used to that and that is a wonderful feeling it's it's not a lot of people associate um gurgling sounds in their stomach when they're towards the end of digestion as being hunger i'm hungry now uh that's not really what that is that you've misinterpreted a signal from your body for so long that you pile on more food every time you get to that stage thinking that that's that's what you need because that does alleviate that kind of pit feeling that you get when the food's just about digested. But that's not that's not mealtime when you feel that. That's not that shouldn't be the signal that oh it's time to eat again. The only signal to to eat is when you're truly hungry. If you're not hungry and especially if you're sick, don't force yourself to eat like mama's chicken noodle soup or whatever. Like there's a lot of uh, ideas that you're supposed to eat. Oh, you got to eat to stay strong. You know, when you're sick, no other animal does that. All animals in nature, when they're sick, they stop eating. They fast. It's the natural thing to do. You're not hungry for a reason. It takes a shitload of energy to digest food three times a day and eliminate it and go through the whole process that all of your internal organs have to do to make sure that everything you're stuffing in the gullet goes out the other end and, and pulls out the nutrients and does everything it needs. When you stop doing that for a while, and your body needs it and if you don't it's going to get sick because you haven't stopped just like any machine you just run it endlessly never stop it never need to clean it you know it doesn't need to take a rest or anything no nope, just run that thing <laughs> to the ground that's what most people do with their digestive system which is the main um you know energy source of of the body they never give it a chance to clean out and so over time you start running you know your digestive tract your system your your colon everything it starts sludging up you're not pulling as much nutrients from your food anymore um you know people get that rock hard 
gut, you know, some some people are just fat and other people have this belly right here that's just rock hard. What that is, is mostly impacted feces. It's, it's it, most people, even people that don't have it showing to that degree, have pounds of feces stuck on the crevices of all these little, show like this, your bowels look like this and they've got these little, these little slits like that everywhere. And what happens is, those, yeah, they cake up with with years of, of solid stuff. And the only way to get rid of that is through water fasting and or enemas, which is my recommendation. If and when you do water fast, you're putting water only through here, and that's cleaning out the system. Water is the universal solvent. It's it's the best and cleanest thing you can use to clean anything from a mechanical system to a biological system. And then while you're doing that, not eat, eating any food for days on end so that you can repair the system, you do an enema or a colon cleanse so that you can go up the other end. And then all the, that impacted feces that's had no chance to to get its way out, now it can have the water soak into it <clears throat> and then it you know, does its thing. It's going to come out and it's going to come out as some of the most disgusting, blackest stinkiest stuff you've probably ever seen when you first do this if you've never done it for a lifetime and and a lot of people are scared of the implications of a tiny little tube going up your rectum an inch or two or whatever it's not a big deal especially once you've done it it's fine you're not gay <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> but you are you are a lot healthier um and it, yeah you just use a little you know vaseline or something just up a tiny little bit that's it, it doesn't feel like much and then what, what what does feel like much is the water coming into your system and you can your stomach will start to fill up with a whole liter and a liter and a half or however much of, of water you put in there don't use coffee some people do that water and then try to leave it in there as long as you can i i get into it i do yoga in the bathroom i'll do handstands and candlestick pose and everything so that i can invert and get the water as far up as it can go. And then only then, as long as you can bear it, because <laughs> the second it's in there, you want to let it go. It's You're not used to having that much water in your bowels, but um, the longer you can keep it in there, or the more you do it over time, you're going to see the results, and you're just going to be so glad that that's in the toilet rather than in you carrying that stuff around for years. You know, why did I do that? Why have I not done this? before now well because it's not promoted just like veganism isn't promoted like uh, or fat water fasting juice fasting these true healing modalities that use food or even the lack of food to heal you are rarely mentioned in modern medicine or you know in the mainstream media all they push is pharmaceuticals and surgery and radiation and chemotherapy and all these really expensive modalities that rarely work and usually harm your body with their side effects more so than whatever the <laughs> effect you started with is a lot of people with uh, chemo for example if they had just gone on a vegan diet and started getting active do breathing exercises and some other holistic um, practices rather than taking a bunch of chemicals and radiation which literally is killing the cancer cells as well as every other cell around it, but they try to target it so that they just kill that part of you before you, all of you dies. But what happens to most people is you end up killing so many healthy cells and you're not actually addressing the root of the problem. So it continues until there's no cells left for you to zap and radiate. You know, you, you, you can't address a problem from the end result. You gotta find out what is causing the problem to begin with? And most people, like I said, with diabetes, it's the same with cancer and it's the same with heart disease and most of our main killers. You can watch a video, what is that called? Uprooting the Leading Causes of Death. It's a meta study on all, um, all the literature in, in medicine that's been done over the past six decades, I think, on comparing vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, and meat eaters and showing that <laughs> on a sliding scale from vegan to vegetarian to pescatarian to meat eaters on literally every factor of the leading causes of death, the 15 leading causes of death other than accidents, 14 of them can be um, prevented or reversed on a vegan diet. 
and they're like I said, it's a tier system. Every single um, factor on the uh, meta study shows that pescatarian is better than meat eating. No. Or, or, or like a probably a standard American diet would be better than the stupid carnivore thing that everyone's pushing now. And then over that, you got your Mediterranean, pescatarian, whatever, and then your vegetarian, and then your vegan. And I'm sure if they did a, some kind of raw vegan study where you eliminate grains and some of these other questionable foods, you would probably be on another tier as well. Um, yeah, well, I forgot where I was going with that, but definitely if people are interested... Uh, to watch that up, uprooting the leading causes of death. It just shows that veganism is has been scientifically shown over and over. This is a meta study, so we're talking about taking all of the scientific literature as a whole and then seeing what are the overall results. And the overall results are a vegan diet can cure, or I can't say cure. It can it can uh, oh. eliminate or reviewer, reverse all um, all these ailments. And yeah, the, the, the medical establishment, they, they own the word like cure and other things so that you have to say stuff like treat or whatever, or else they can come down on you with their whole machinery. If you say that something like a vegan diet can cure X, Y, Z, they're like, no, I can't. No, I can't. There's no proof to that. And, and you know, they'll take you to court and they'll shut you down like they've done with a lot of people who have tried this. So you got to be like super careful about even trying to recommend a free therapy to people like this, you know? How do you even make money telling people to eat fruit? <laughs> it's, it, so nobody does it. Everybody pushes the stupid pharmaceutical companies so they can get their kickbacks and their vacations to Hawaii and everything that the doctors are running to the bank with, stealing everybody's life savings at the, the final moment of their life, trying to give them another two months or something of on a, on a breathing apparatus or whatever it is, versus if you actually were proactive about your health, did the research, found out the things we're finding, and you can... You know, I was 25 years old when I became vegan, and a lot of people, they meet me and they think I'm in my 20s. They, it's, uh, you, you, you can do an experiment on yourself. You may be able to reverse aging. You can, there's people like, um, what's her name? Annette Larkins. She's like, like, how old is she now? She's 80. I don't even know how old she is now, but look up Annette Larkins. There's people that have been on this path for a long enough that it's obvious the benefits. You have to be a, a blind, deaf, mute <laughs> alien to, to look at some of these people and think, I mean, her. I think her husband, he either just died or he's, he's on his deathbed right now. He didn't, actually, I think just before he, he transitioned, he tried to do some vegetarian or whatever, but her husband was like a butcher for most of his life. And he didn't want to be a, you know, a vegetarian, but he, even him, what was funny is, is towards the end of his, his life is everyone thought she was his daughter. Oh, you got your daughter with you. It's like, <laughs> no, this, this is my wife. And they're like, really? Because the difference yeah. between the butcher and the vegan, the raw vegan who grew her own uh, fruits and vegetables and does juicing all the time and promoted it, um, it was it's obvious that it's visually i mean you know he, he can't walk he can't sit up straight and and everything versus she looks like the the youngest 80 plus year old woman that you've ever seen basically i mean and, and that's just one example she's not unique she's just the one that comes to mind there's mimi kirk for example you can find another there's many many others as many men who have done bodybuilding and they don't do any supplements even there's one guy whose name's not going to come to me, but he's been vegan since birth, no supplements, and he's got a really nice physique, the kind of physique that anybody would want that's not not that, not that the Arnold steroid physique. I mean, obviously The Rock and Arnold Schwarzenegger and people of that um, size, that's medical. You don't get that size yeah. just, just from weightlifting and eating meat and dairy or, or whatever. Um, they're injecting stuff, or at some point they were. Um, but uh, and, and so people that are obsessed with with weightlifting, they they don't really want to get on the vegan diet. But you don't really lose anything. I mean, have you noticed? Yeah, as long as you maintain your weightlifting regimen, and as long as you eat enough so that you have enough calorie intake, 
it, it, you don't need meat and dairy and eggs and ice cream and all this crap to be able to keep or build mass. There's plenty of vegan bodybuilders that are building mass, not, not just maintaining, but building it on a vegan diet. It's just like anything. You just got to eat enough. That, that, that was actually what sold me when, you know, I was arguing with you in comments about killing mosquitoes, driving vegetables to the farmer's market, you know, was when you came out with that series of, of vegan bodybuilders. And I was like, OK, this is totally possible. You know, and I spent years, you know, I'm, I'm 43 now. So I think uh, since I started doing activism, I kind of started aging in dog years. But uh, it uh, again, that's, you know, everything's good now. Right. And so it's like everybody's happy as far, you know, ish. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, it's not nearly as stressful as it was for the previous like six, five or six years. And so I I weigh the same now as I did in high school. Uh, so I'm right now I'm probably just under 200 pounds, right at 200 pounds, I guess. And, you know, my deal now to, to and I, I work construction, right? So I'm picking stuff up all the time. I'm moving a lot. And uh, my routine is I just knock a few push ups out in the morning. And, you know, I've got one of those pull up bars over the door over there. And I just, you know, crank out a few pull ups every day. And if work slows down and I've got the time to, to really focus on, you know, dialing the health aspect of, of myself back in. If I spend a week, you know, doubling up on the push-ups and doubling up on the pull-ups, the it's instant, right? I can, you know, instantly the the muscle mass is there again, and and it's so easy for me to maintain it. And you were talking about uh, like uh, digestive problems with with over meat consumption, and that was what. So I used to work at GNC when I was in, you know, when I was paying my way through school. And so I'm familiar with all those products and all of it, used all of them, you know, and, and it's exactly what you said, right? You, you kind of gain bulk, but you're not as cut as you want to be. And you're always trying to get cut. And now it's like, if I want a six pack, you know, I can have it in a week. It's not a problem, right? I just make little tweaks to my diet, do a few more push-ups and pull-ups and, and I'm there. But when I was, uh, when I was 32, I, uh, you know, I thought I had it figured out and I was running around just, working 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 and and my go-to in my diet was to just grill up a bag of chicken and then put a bunch of cheese on it and roll it up in a tortilla and i was basically just living off of that and what do you know like ended up in the hospital like you know it was like one day i started having this crazy pain down like uh kind of like in, in my lower stomach and i was like man it'll go away whatever you know man up push through it and I was out in the yard and I was, I was mowing and I was like, oh God, something's wrong, you know? And so I, I came in and I told Bethany, I was like, I think you need to take me to the hospital now. I could feel, you know, I could feel I was fading out, right? And I was like, this, this is not good. And so she ran, ran me over to the ER and I was like, I have no idea what's wrong. I wasn't doing anything that I haven't been doing for years. And, uh, you know, like, they, they took me in immediately and I was like, look, like, I, I'm not like, this is awful. Like, I, this is the worst pain I've ever been in in my life and I've got a pretty high pain tolerance. And they were like, OK, so they did a couple of tests or something. And they were like, oh, yep, you've got your your small intestine is perforated mm. as a result of eating all this meat and cheese. And it just sitting in there like, you know, being a complete idiot, ignoring all the warning signs my body was giving me basically for years prior to that. But for me, I was always just looking in the mirror and I was like, well, I've still got my muscles and that's all that really matters. Like, and so they ended up having to cut, cut me right down the middle and they took mm. out six inches of my small intestine right where it, it meets up with my, my large intestine. Mm. And so they had to cut all my abdominals and you know, it, was, it was a mess, it was a disaster. And, uh, and so you know, he told me before I went under that they were gonna go in laparoscopically. And I was like, okay, like do your thing doc, whatever. And uh, sure enough, when I woke up in the ICU, I looked down and I've got staples, you know, running from from here all the way down to to the bottom of my gut. And I, you know, ripped all that stuff out of my throat. And I was like, what happened? And the <laughs> nurse was like, oh, my, you know, they had me so high on morphine or whatever. And uh, and so I was trying to get out of there. I was like, people don't come to the hospital to get better. They come to the hospital to die. Let me out. And uh the doctor was like, okay, calm down, calm down. I was like, what happened to the laparoscopic thing? He was like, dude, we got in there and there was just nothing left. Mm. He was like, that section of your gut was just 
destroyed. Had you come in a few days earlier, maybe we could have given you antibiotics mm. and that would have like curbed it or whatever. But, you know, I've never been into to eating any of that stuff. Mm. And uh, and so it ended up taking me probably three years to honestly recover from it because mm. I still didn't understand the diet aspect of it. And so I asked the doc on the, the way out of the hospital, he was like, well, if you leave, you could die. I was like, look, I'm leaving. So give me your advice on how I can avoid whatever this was. Again, you're saying it's diverticulitis. I've never heard of this. Mm. You know, and it was like when I was in high school, I was my junior and senior year. I was in this uh, thing called HOSA, which was Health Occupation Students of America. And so we get to go to the hospital and, and watch open heart surgeries standing right there, watch, you know, like all kinds of surgeries and rotated, rotated through each different department in the hospital. And so I, you know, I've got a pretty good working knowledge of medical lingo and, and what's going on there. And I was like, dude, I've never heard of diverticulitis. And you're telling me it almost killed me? Like, and then he goes, yeah, he's like, that, that's it. I was like, what causes this? And he was like, we don't know. And I was like, what? He was like, people think maybe it's seeds get stuck in the diverticulum and you're, and I was like, seeds? <laughs> like I'm not eating anything with seeds. I'm just eating a bunch of chicken, you know. And he like kind of poked my arm, and he was like, "You got all, you know, you're doing good on the muscle thing." And I was like, "What?" But now I, I can't. I'm, you know, I need my body to make a living. I can't like, you know, this thing has to work, and it has to work awesome. Like, what caused this? How do I avoid this? And on the way out, you know, God bless him. He was an, an awesome surgeon, you know, and and so not a big fan of Western medicine as far as all the treatments and nonsense go, but. When there's an emergency and you need somebody to like sew you back up, there you are. Right. But uh, his advice to me was like, well, just go, you know, go to the grocery store and get something that's easy to digest, like ice cream. And I was like, what? You want me to eat a bunch of like lactose and like when you just sewed like this is crazy. How in the world has Western medicine, you know, when you've taken a vow to do no harm, mm. like what is going on with, you know, the, the vaccine schedules for toddlers and, you know, you, like, you don't, like, you, you don't know what caused me to like get a hole in my intestine. Like you got nothing for me. Mm -hmm. I told you what I was eating, you know, like just clueless. And so it was like, okay. So, you know, I think naturally I started incorporating more vegetables in, you know, like your grandma tells you, but I still just didn't have it figured out until again, until you, you really pushed on the vegan thing. And, you know, like I said, it took, took time. I was like vegetarian and, and my body responded so well to that. And it was like, okay, for me, ethically, like, it's not just about like how I feel and look. It's like, I need to be correct in my own mind with how I'm interacting with the world around me. And so that was what caused me to go to the next level, especially after you showed me that, you know, you had eight or nine bodybuilders and especially when you were talking about that's never had any animal products. And I was like, oh my gosh. This is not that difficult. Mm. You know, this is just, you know, it's the same game. It's, you know, protein, fiber, carbs, fat, and, and getting the right mix of it and doing my best to, to eat real, you know, still live like fruits, vegetables, things that still have life in them. And uh, yeah, it, it, it changed me entirely. But I understand exactly what you're saying as far as the importance of our digestive system. And so it uh, been there. Holy moly. Mm. But uh yeah, you say a net Larkin. I'll look her up later. Yeah, a net Larkin. So, you mentioned uh, doing a bit of the breathing exercises. Have you noticed any kind of positive, positives, any pros, any benefit from uh, what you've done on, on that? Absolutely. And so I still, like for me, <clears throat> uh, it'll kind of consist of like, uh, so I've only ever done yoga once, right? When I was living out in Dallas, I went to a yoga class and I was still like really flexible and still in really good shape. And, and I guess it was like an intermediate class I went to with some of the people I was working with when I was out in an office building and all this stuff. And, uh, and, and definitely I was like, wow, that was amazing. You know, just after one hour of doing yoga, it, it, it worked for me. And so being kind of lazy now, I've kind of stick to chair yoga right where i try and focus on like uh tightening up my core correcting my posture and then just really focusing on you know in through the nose out through the mouth and i'll just spend like 10 minutes of just really trying to oxygenate myself and and calm myself and 
it changes my day. And so it, uh, I know it's not the discipline practice that people that know what they're really doing are up to, but just making a point to really focus on, on my breathing, you know, it, it, it relieves sore muscles. It's like, it, it lowers my appetite. It's the, the benefits are, they're all over the place. Mm. And so the, the one thing I haven't really tried yet is, is actual fasting. And so I've got a buddy that uh, he was pretty involved in like Native American stuff. He goes up to Sundance every year and, uh, you know, fasting is part of their deal uh, when he's up there. And so he's told me the longest he's ever gone, I think, with with no food and very, very minimal water, like a couple of sips of water a day, maybe. And so I, I'm not sure. I don't know. He's gone 13 days without taking without eating food at all. And so I don't I don't even think I've ever made it 24 hours. But uh, that's kind of the next thing on my list to give a shot when I feel like I can work it out with my schedule. You know, because like today is going to end up being 108 degrees here, probably 50% humidity. And on a normal day, you know, I might be on a roof, I might be under a house, like who knows. And so I, you know, I'm not trying to get lightheaded and fall off a ladder or something ridiculous, right? But, uh, and so for me, like having some calories in me is important. But, it, yeah, if you're uh, doing, if you're doing, you know, manual labor, or you have something that's on a timetable. You know, you're doing nine to five work. I would not recommend fasting. When you're fasting, you're going to have bursts of energy. You'll at some points you'll have more energy than you normally do, but then at other points you'll just crash and you'll really want to just take a nap. Um, so it's kind of that. It's that kind of inconsistent energy. And so for anyone that is fasting, I wouldn't recommend trying to do your normal routine during a fast. You should set aside time to do it, similar to when you're sick. If you're sick, you don't just go ahead and do everything that you would always do um, when you're sick. You have this whole new sick routine that you do where you you love yourself a bit more, you cater to yourself a bit more, and you, you say no to, to other things outside of yourself. That's exactly what you should be doing when you're fasting. It's a spiritual thing as well, where you focus completely on yourself and on your health and it's not easy because you are going to want to eat <laughs> and and you're going to have all this free time because you're not doing your typical routine and you're not thinking about what you're going to eat. You're not preparing what you're going to eat. You're not eating it. You're not digesting it. You're not eliminating it and then thinking about the next thing or shopping for the next thing you're going to eat. You, and you find out how much time you spend thinking about food all day or not just thinking about it, but just involved with food. It, it is such a big thing with, with your life. And then once you start fasting, which I don't recommend doing like 13 days from your first time, I would recommend a day for your first time and then go from there, two days, three days, and then work your way up. Um, uh, but when you when you do get to that stage, you'll start to really like the feeling of emptiness and not having anything in your stomach to the point that you won't feel those brief pangs of hunger when you're still actually digesting and your stomach is making those gurgling noises because it's not fully digested yet. Um, you'll go from from that feeling like, oh, time to eat again. I'm hungry to feeling like, oh, actually, I, I do. There's yoga moves that you can do where you move the stomach and you move the muscles so that it'll make a bunch of noise and it will quickly digest the food that's left over. And so for me, when, when I do hear the gurgling noise, it's time to make more gurgling noises, but I can actually do it right now. No, I can't do it right now. Shoot, I thought I'd be able to do it live, but no. Um, <laughs> uh, but and then as you do it, you'll you'll gas will come up and down. That's one obviously a thing that happens through digestion. Um, and when you do these yoga moves, you're basically forcing faster digestion. Get the gas out. Oh, that's another reason I like doing yoga by myself, <laughs> you know, in a big <laughs> yeah. yoga class in an enclosed room in a heated, like the, the hot yoga. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine a more torturous yoga experience. For me, I, I only do private lessons and I usually do them outside in the park. Um, and for my own practice, I mean, yeah, yoga, you're stretching and, and digesting and doing breathing practices. You're often going to burp and fart and you should that's the point <laughs> that's what you're doing you're you're releasing these things um, but in a public classroom setting it's just really difficult to do which is why another reason why 
it's really important to do it by yourself. You got to have a, a personal yoga practice that you do. And similar with the breathing, it's it's a weird thing to do. Um, you know, take these long breaths through your nose and make that that like a Darth Vader type cat purring sound, and then to release vocal ohms and, and all this stuff. It for me, I I'm, I get self conscious, and I don't like doing it uh, as a big group. So when I became a teacher, uh, I didn't want to put people through that. <laughs> Neither did I want to be put through it. So um, both with martial arts and yoga, I just taught private lessons. And for me, that's that's the ultimate anyway. As a, now that I've taught both, you know, when you teach a class of something, there's a bunch of sacrifices that you make for the because you have 20 students or 10 students or 50, however many it is, versus one. When you can do one on one teaching, whether it's yoga or martial arts, or I'd be convinced pretty much anything else on this earth, the the direct line that you get, and this is also why I do one on one podcasts. I prefer one on one interactions always. The second you get a third party in there or more, the this direct communication that you can have with somebody is now splintered and the best you can have is kind of this third wheel conversation where you, you can never get as deep into whatever subject these two minds want to talk about because there's always going to be the third mind that's going to no matter how aligned it is is going to take the conversation elsewhere and so for me even not not in podcast format but just in my life I always like hanging out with one friend at a time or one family member at a time. I always feel like I have the most, you know, uh, uh, valuable interactions um, that way versus, which is funny because the Dubai family is, they're like the opposite. They love to get together, all of them, all at once. And for this birthday party, for that party, for everything, any, any excuse you could have to invite everybody all together. And it's nice to have that family setting um, sometimes, I guess. But for me, the the introvert, the extreme introvert in the family, um, I've always preferred this way and, and found that you can get a level of deepness and like a level of closeness to somebody when you interact this way that you can't when you're in this group setting and there's all these distractions and other people pitching in and everything. Um, and that's how I've actually kind of chosen friends throughout lifetime. My lifetime is that I've, I kind of sit back. I'm always in the corner of the room, noticing everybody, and I'll I'll see people that I'll be like, that guy looks interesting to me. The way they sit, you know, they, they care about their posture, the the way they swivel their head and pay attention to conversations, the way that they seem to have a meditative awareness and they're not knee jerk reacting to things and triggered or whatever. Um, and then you hear them speak or the things they choose to respond to and the way that they talk, you can filter out so many headaches out of your life just being this way, which is why I am this way, <laughs> rather than just being an extroverted center of attention, being in the middle of the room and trying to have all eyes on you, which comes normal, natural to certain personality types. It can also get them into a lot of trouble because of their ostentatious way of being. Uh, for me, especially as a natural introvert, I've found a lot of benefits from waiting. For example, with the flat earth community, as it starts to come up around me, you know, I just, like I said, I, I watch everybody. Even these people, I don't, I don't like some guy that says he was my follow, he's my cult follower. And then for years after that, he's, he goes on saying how the earth's definitely a globe and here's why the flat earth is, I still pay attention. I'm, I'm that guy. I'm that guy in the corner of the room just watching everything, making my own little conclusions. And, you know, <laughs> I'll approach <laughs> you. And if somebody approaches me, uh, it's interesting. It's like, why are you approaching me over here in the corner? What have I done to attract attention? It's a red flag. <laughs> um, but uh, now I'm just going off on a tangent now about my own personal preferences and conversation. But that is why I did this particular format for the podcast of only one-on-one -on -one interviews and also why I fade in and out rather than trying to maintain the integrity of the entire podcast and have the whole thing. It's why I don't do live interviews too often as well. 
I like to be able to edit and to see myself and my guest and decide for my audience what is relevant and what should be for public consumption. And I like to have my time with my guests. A lot of these people, you know, I consider you my friend in the sense that I've wanted to talk to you and a lot of these people that I'm currently talking to for years, or I have been talking to you for years, but only this way. And so this is an opportunity to try and deepen a relationship that for me has been difficult because now I've become that person in the center of the room that everyone's looking at and I'm like, oh, the earth's <laughs> flat. Do you know the earth is flat? And it's like, what? <laughs> well, I went from the, it. Yeah, I'm yeah that's it. You. That's what it was. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is my thing. I felt it when I, you know, I spent years researching it before I came to a, a, a moment. I remember the moment I was sitting here on a bed just like this after reading one of those old flat earth books and after because I was weighing out the evidence for a long time before I came to that final conclusion. I was like, yes, it truly is. There's nothing left. I don't have any questions left. I know all the answers. I know all the, oh, but what about, but what about, but what? No, I already know all the, but what abouts. There's nothing left. And, and I just kind of sat there for a while, just like, so this is it. I told my parents before that, told other people, I, was like, I think the earth is flat. I'm pretty damn sure the earth is flat. I'm 99% sure. You know, they were with me along the journey and I'd, try and explain it to them and my parents are cool because they were with me since obviously since the beginning and when I first was into this I learned about 9-11 and I I turned my dad right off to the point he didn't want to talk to me anymore and uh, yeah because I was not very good at expressing these things and in your face about it as as you get because you, you get an emotional reaction to all this stuff you're learning and then you you don't become the best vehicle for communicating it at that point because you're too you're overly emotional and and tr trying to wake the other person up rather than just letting you know because you, you can't do you can't, you want to you want to like take them by the shoulders and shake them and be like this is what you need to do for a better life and for all of us you need to change because if you don't change and i just change myself that's not enough so, <laughs> <Nailed it. laughs> so you want to do that but obviously that doesn't work they're like what? <laughs> all that does is make them even more sure that they don't want to change in your direction because you're being too pushy and, and you're, you know, over enthusiastic and um, your communication style is too forward and you're not asking questions. You're telling them things that they didn't even want to know. <laughs> so, and it's and every, almost everybody does it unless you're a real effective communicator before you come across this stuff. You're going to go through this thing that I, I and many others have gone through because basically you... Yeah, I was the guy in the corner of the room reading all these books until I was like, I just, nobody else is reading these books, are they? <laughs> well, I just came across the most important thing ever, and I'm going to walk to the middle of the room now and start screaming. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> Everyone's like, what? Well, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, good on you. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, yeah, if if you can temper that uh, that thing, I would I would recommend slowly working your way to the middle of the room and and you know raising your voice a little bit at a time rather than shouting right from the middle and alienating everyone right from the get-go which is what i did to my parents but what i was going to say is that the cool thing is that is that after we got through that initial bit and then you know my dad started talking to me again and i had him watch uh, some conspiracy documentaries and we, we watched them on skype together and talked about them while we're watching them and from then on from the from the first documentary we watched onwards his whole attitude has changed for 15 years now and it'll never go back and you know he's he's open and he's interested and he he don't he no longer he was he was a 24 7 newspaper you know six o'clock news 11 o'clock whatever the news is on everything news news he was a news guy and he thought he was the most informed person because of how up to on current events he was and then for his at the time what 24 25 year old kid coming along saying all this stuff that he'd never heard of before the government's involved in all these conspiracies and stuff he's just like you have lost it you've gone on the deep end and and i and he wanted to talk about anything else but that and me obsessing you know researching all day every day about it that's all i wanted to talk about then to the point that he'd ask, well, what did you do this week? And it's like, well, uh, I read three conspiracy books, watched 10 documentaries. <laughs> you know, there was nothing even that I could talk about besides that. 
So eventually they caved in and they just sort of, my mom said, you know, you don't have to believe him or, or agree with him. Just listen to him. He's your son. You stop talking to him for months because you don't like what he's saying. Just, just yup him. Just, uh-huh. You know, she gave him that advice. And um, so that was enough for him to at least come back and start talking again. And, and ever since then, everything's been cool. They've now been vegan for almost, they're going on 12 years for your, your mom as well. And my dad, yeah. Nice. Um, and at first, you know, <laughs> they came at me with the same things everyone does. They're like, well, Eric, we're worried about your health. Are you sure that's healthy to not eat any animal products at all? What about B12? What about this and that? And I would get emails from them and I'd you know, and Skype and stuff. And we'd talk for years about it. And I, the, and again, you know, this is why I say this for activism. The thing that converted my dad to understanding conspiracies in 9-11 was that loose change documentary. And the thing that got both of them to go vegan was the forks over knives documentary. Documentaries, you know, we're in 20, we're in the 21st century now. The main way you can wake people up isn't through, um, you know, uh, uh, yelling through a bullhorn or a sign on the street even or uh, a conversation. For, for, for my experience, the best way to wake people up is to get them to actually sit down, shut up, and watch an informative documentary on the subject at hand. Because that's, even the best speaker in the world can't captivate someone's attention and hold it and show them point by point evidence and visual evidence and everything in a 90 minutes. I couldn't even do it. I couldn't you give me 90 minutes to try and outline flat earth to some willing listener for sure some scripted thing that i wrote and spent weeks and months and then compiling and putting videos and pictures and everything and music even or what and so that it becomes a piece of media that brings them into the moment captures their attention shows them point by point information in a way that off the cuff some guy in a conversation shooting the shit with his friends at the bar you just can't get that level of truth conveyed in that medium and that's why i've gone sort of full force on the medium of video i feel you know even though at heart at heart i'm a writer the thing i enjoy to do more i'm an introvert i don't like to be on video i don't like talking even really i'd rather write that's my thing i enjoy to write but um the way to get my written word out there in 2023 is this way and so that's why I've done so many scripted videos and I, I tell people to try and push the videos. That's that's how people learn. And when you're watching a video, you're by yourself. You're in a you're in a space where you can learn new things and accept new things because nobody's around you making fun of you. Nobody is asking you stuff or, or t taking your attention elsewhere. You get all the things that you need to think about, like, oh, is the earth really flat? Am I going to become one of those crazy flat earthers? I don't want that to happen. Ugh. But it does seem the, the evidence is piling up. I mean, I guess I, well, I have to be the crazy guy now. Like, you have to go through that rather than your friend saying, there's foot, man. Haven't you looked into it yet? Dude, NASA's telling you lies. Like, we've never been to the moon. Do you, do you still believe that shit? Do you believe we've been to the moon? <laughs> he believes it's been to the moon. And so, you know, maybe. I mean, that would be a really bad way to introduce your friend to it. But some things like that happen. Or even even if you're trying your best, the way that the conversation goes He's going to have too many of his own things. You're going to have too many of your own things. Whereas if you can get somebody to just shut down their this <laughs> and this long enough to just use these and these on a audiovisual presentation, it's the most effective way to wake people up to anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. How long, like... Yeah, I, like for example, how long did it take you to to write and produce the flat Earth conspiracy documentary? Like to to get all that in one place with all the visuals, the music. I loved it. Uh, mm -hmm. How what what does that even take? You know, I just bought a laptop last week so we could have this kind of like you know not trying to get too into the technology oh my gosh it's been even just buying this laptop just to turn it on they were like sign up for this do a retinal scan da, 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 da. <laughs> you know it was like oh my gosh this is like or you know put your fingerprint on the thing it was like mm. ugh, i saw why i was 
staying away from all this. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as like, I don't know, I'm kind of enjoying it, like watching YouTube videos on it, like documentaries on it. But what what kind of like is it sometimes I guess you start things and then maybe weeks or months go by and you go back. Like You probably have multiple projects going on at once. Or do you sit down and just try and hammer something out and then produce it? Like what what's involved in that process for you? Uh, it's changed over time. Uh, for that initial bit there, uh, I, I, you know, I wasn't doing weekly videos pre Flat Earth. I, I was much more spotty. Um, ever since I exploded all that stuff on, I've tried to stay consistent. Um, but before it, yeah, I spent a lot of time writing the Flat Earth Conspiracy book and uh, making that documentary, and I had even planned a few interviews so that I would and a couple other vi videos that I'd made. So I had like I had a set of stuff that I felt like it was I think it was November 14th, 2014. I just that was it. And then <laughs> it's been go time ever since then, because, you know, it was. Nobody was talking about it, yet it's it's the most fundamental scientific subject that everything is built on this lie. And that's the funny thing. Everyone's like, well, why would they lie about the flat earth? Why would, you know, it seems when you haven't actually looked into it, like it would be the most uh, innocuous thing to lie about. Like, why would you bother to lie about that? What is the point? Um, but when you see how they've ingeniously built lie after lie on top of this one foundational lie, we're, we've gotten to the point we are today where a uh, vast majority of people believe they came from a godless, non-spiritual universe that was exploded into existence for no reason and didn't exist before it. And then everything existed for and through physical collisions somehow and in the primordial soup, agency and consciousness and life and everything we see around us just randomly, haphazardly, for no reason, came into existence and stopped being uh, just material collisions and started being individual units of life that have agency and start doing their own thing. And it's a it's ridiculous. ridiculous. Yeah. It's an absolutely ridiculous when is anything slash organized? philosophy slash religion. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a it's an encompassing worldview, I guess you would call it, because it's beyond any one of those things. It's 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 science, cosmology, religion, um, history. You know, all of these things, they're trying to build it into this one paradigm that is even, like I said, even most religious people fit it into their, <laughs> meaning most Christians, for instance, would fit, somehow fit the godless Big Bang evolution globe earth paradigm into the Bible. But oh, they do it. They, 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 make, like, they make mental no leaps. To, yeah. yeah. In my head, it used to make perfect sense. It was like, well, if God wanted to do it that way, then that's the way God did it. Right. You know, and it was like just completely irrational you know the the why would they lie question I, I get that we're not them and so we don't know exactly but for me like what seems kind of like i say obvious but it's just like uh as as various forms of media came into existence over the last say 100 years or so like obviously if you're trying to control like you know if a tiny handful of people are trying to control everyone uh like yeah, to, as you've said before, to get people confused about like just completely apparent and basic aspects of reality and to turn off their own common sense and then to go to one of these, like to go to the radio back in the day or go to the television now and turn on the news and trust the guy who's dressed up like an expert and he's good at speaking and you'll just trust whatever comes out of their mouth, like to the point where you're now injecting toddlers with 40 different, you know, vaccines, like before they show up to kindergarten, like that that's the way to do it. You know, why would they lie is so that you stop using your common sense. So you stop using critical thinking skills and and just do whatever you're told. And so, you know, I think there's other benefits they get from it, like the money and all this other stuff. But, uh, you know, to me, it's real obvious. It's, it's the ultimate form of control. If people are so deluded mentally, you know, as, as a population, that the majority of the population doesn't think like water finds its own level like the most abundant thing in this realm, like, and, and people don't even understand the most basic aspect of it, mm. right? That, that you know, it, uh, of course, they're going to be way easier to control. 
And so, you know, why would they lie? Who really knows? But uh, it it seems really obvious to me that, yeah, uh, you know, it, it's so people don't think for themselves. And then the effect of people not thinking for themselves, like, spills out into every other aspect of their life where they're, you know, unhealthy, they're sick, they're running around, you know, nine to five consuming, spending every cent they make that's not even benefiting them. It's not bringing them any happiness, joy. It's not helping anybody in their family around them. Uh, and so, yeah, why would they lie? Like, why does anybody lie? Right. It's to, to get some advantage over the person that's being lied to, but, uh, yeah, naughty, naughty. So <laughs> and I, it's, uh, it's a materialistic philosophy, a materialistic spirituality, if you will, it's their literal, it's like a paradox. So, because that's what they're saying. They're saying the origin of everything, including your consciousness and, and your internal experience, your spirituality, comes from a big bang, an explosion that came for no reason. And so, you know, as you're living your life that way, believing in that kind of worldview, why would you live your life with integrity and live for, try to uh, aspire to a higher consciousness or um, th things of that nature, or enlightenment, what does that even matter if, you know, you just die and you're, you're buried six feet in a hole in the ground, your consciousness is annihilated at your death, and your internal experience doesn't really matter uh, other than your own selfish pleasures. So people spend their life accruing material wealth and um, satisfying themselves with material pleasures, because if that materialist philosophy that they promote endlessly is what you truly believe, then that's the end result. That's what makes sense. Why would you do anything else besides have a personally, selfishly pleasurable existence and have everyone else do that? If that's what the, this world is, if that's really what we're involved in, that's pretty much what makes sense. So they're changing your common sense. They're changing what makes sense to you by giving you a false philosophy. And then when you believe in that false philosophy, it internally changes you into a whole different type of human that you, you might not have been. You might have been way more spiritual and, and selfless and caring about higher consciousness and reaching enlightenment and, and trying to help other people versus just trying to do whatever the most pleasurable thing you can do in your experience for your time here would be. Um, or, or whatever else. I mean, there's... I don't like the idea that so many things are pushed as the only option, as the heliocentric model is, or as most religions are in whatever country you're from. I'm from America, so Christianity's pushed, you know, bar none, and from Thailand, almost everyone's Buddhist, and you go in the Middle East, everyone's, you know, Muslim. And it's like, wh why is my spirituality up to my geography? Like, what, what happened in on the earth that people decided to break themselves off into uh, little sections, not only nation states, but religion states as well. So you got how many more places are we going to get divided rather than realizing that, you know, we're all one. There's only one human race. There's only one earth. All those dividing lines are fake. Spirituality, we're all talking about the same thing. Like I said, all religions are like a finger pointing to the moon and everyone focuses on the finger instead of all that heavenly glory. The whole point is is uh, to focus on the ineffable, the beyond, and so you can't believe in it or say bar none that it is this, and all other religions are wrong. The second you do that, you're wrong. Now you've just you've overstepped your bounds of truth. You're no longer a detective in this realm, you know, this mystery that we're all involved in. You just became a self-imposed authority figure who says you know it because you believe this thing and your belief makes you better than everyone else because apparently you know belief in jesus means you get to go to heaven and non-belief in the historicity of jesus means i'm the antichrist and i'm gonna go to hell people say all the time because i dared to make a video that's titled jesus christ never existed and so now but even though i live my life much more so like jesus christ the character than many Christians, many people who believe that he was a physical person who actually existed in history versus me, who I've read the Bible twice. I understand the stories. I see them as parables, <laughs> as did everyone else around Jesus to the point that like 
like Jesus shows up on the scene in the New Testament and he gives like five or six parables back to back to the point that his disciples are like, why are you only talking in parables? You literally don't open your mouth unless to talk in a parable. And he says, yeah, I do that on purpose so that those with eyes to see and ears to hear will understand and those without will be deluded. He's purposely speaking in code so that only the people who can use their right brain and see through the stories as being parables and allegories rather than literal history, which is what it's been propagated as since then. He's uh, saying, that, like, I'm literally putting blinders on, on the eyes of these people. So it, to me, the majority of self-professed Christians in 2023 are those people Jesus was talking about that don't have eyes to see or ears to hear, and they profess themselves Christian, but they're not. Versus someone like me, who I've read the books, I've understood them, I, I, and not just the Christian books. I've read, you know, the Jainist texts, the Buddhist texts, the Taoist texts. I've read the Quran. I've read all these because, rather than, like I said, having my spirituality be up to my geography, I wanted to see what everybody was up to. What, what do you all believe in? And you know what I found? All shades of the same gray. <laughs> it, everyone's pointing to the same thing, but they're using their cultural language to talk about it. Everyone's got their own unique way of describing the ineffable. And of course, it's never going to be the same because it's ineffable. It's beyond human conception, thought, language. Like the first line of the Tao says, the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. But let's keep talking anyway about what this Tao thing is that I can't talk about. Which is a, which is why it's one of my top. If I if I were to make a tier list of religious books, I really like Taoism and Taoist thinking. Um, it admits its inherent limitations from the very first line. Unlike, say, Christian <laughs> theology, which takes incredible leaps and bounds right from the first line, saying that your imaginary friend created everything in existence and then saying exactly how it happened with the first, the names of the people and ex the exact number of years that they lived. And then they figure out that the earth is only 6,000 years old from a completely literal tra translation of everything that is is there. But Jesus himself said not to take it literally. You know, the, it's, it's clear throughout the Bible. I don't think most people who take the Bible completely literally have actually read it themselves cover to cover with only their own mind thinking like what do i think about this most people go to church and then they have a priest tell them or something <clears throat> like that and then they just they cut up little bits and pieces and so it what christianity is to the average christian is quite an interesting thing i'll, I'll be talking to some christians shortly and that's my main question i mean we can we could we'll we'll go from there but the main question is what do you think makes you a christian versus me a non-christian because I, like I was saying earlier, is I live my life much, a lot like most Christians try to live their life as well, um, or, or people of other religions, you know, but I don't subscribe to any of them. And a lot of people will say, if you don't have religion in the world, or if you don't have religion in your life, how do you be a good person? Or how do you know what's right? Or how, how can you be moral? I've never thought that that was based on religion whatsoever. Um, religious texts can outline suggestions and recommendations thou shalt not do this or that and you can agree or disagree and in certain moments that makes sense and in certain situations maybe that doesn't make sense you know yeah thou shalt not do this uh, to start with but what if someone else do does this to you <laughs> now what, how do you deal with that in the moment now you know for instance if somebody's trying to kill you and you are in a locked room with a murderer Thou shalt not kill. I, how, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's, after it's you or it's, like... it's you or him, and, and that's why I, um, for instance, I like uh, the Bhagavad Gita a little bit more. Maybe I've always said this is, you know, I could make a tier list of religions. Um, it's not, it's not a beneficial thing to do though, which is why I, I, I stray from giving a hierarchy like this religion's better than that religion or this holy book is better. But for me, my personal sensibilities, everybody has their own opinions. And for me, I enjoy the Eastern religions and their holy texts much more than the Western ones. They just speak to me so much more. For instance, when Arjuna is on the battlefield, getting ready to 
have to fight with his own family members and, and other people. Um, Krishna comes to him and, you know, he doesn't want to fight. Why, why should I fight? These are my friends and family. These are people I love, but they've just, they've become deluded, maybe similar to like this flat earth thing. <laughs> you know, you're the crazy flat earther that's trying to uh, change their whole lifestyle. And then they come with pitchforks and, and everything trying to uh, confront you. Now, in his case, of course, this was an actual war. It's like a Lord of the Rings, you know, showdown type of thing. And they're just on the battlefield beforehand. And he's wanting to just give up. I should just lay down and die anyway. Why would I want to kill my friends and family over this? And, and Krishna says to him, well, first of all, he explains the state of uh, reincarnation and that there really is no death and that, OK, somebody's going to die, but they're just going to be born again anyway. And so if you just lay down and die and allow the evil people in the world to take over, then you're just going to be born of them. <laughs> and the whole world is going to be the, controlled by them. And you yourself will be also in your new reincarnation. And so by not standing up and fighting for what you know to be right, what you found in this lifetime is worth standing up for and, and dying for if need be, so what he does is he changes Arjuna's mindset from him wanting to just give up and even die, just let them kill him because he doesn't even see a reason to 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 go to this war. It seems like a senseless waste of life. But they're going to kill him. They're not going to stop, is what Krishna said. It's like, just because you wave a white flag and try to, it's not going to stop them. You're just going to die. And that's the, that's the reality of self-defense, for instance, or why I started talking about this, thou shalt not kill. Well, sure, thou shalt not kill for no reason <laughs> but um, self-defense for example is a reason where um, even legally speaking murder is justified so i mean what so the bible disagrees with the, in the entire history of the legal system like we've we've found that no there are circumstances when you either need to kill or you die yourself and why should the bad guy always win in that situation just because the good guy is trying to be like Jeebus and like, I'm so, you know, innocent and I can't harm a fly. I can't do anything because, oh, hit me on the other side. Oh, you know, that's what I've been taught. This is true virtue. I need to be a victim and, a, you know, just let everyone do whatever they want to me. And like, um, you know, like in the Passion of the Christ or like that Gandhi movie I think of where they're just whipping him. Like that's been promoted into our uh, cultural milieu like that's what a good person is just the ultimate victim or something but there's people in history like viking theology and viking um uh philosophy which was that like the pe person who vanquished the most foes would go to the highest level of heaven <laughs> it's very different so in other words the, the the most murderous among you would be the most worthy of heaven whoa so, I mean, there's religions, there's philosophies throughout time that have the exact opposite ideas of those that are prevalent today. But even talking about them or trying to live that way uh, is quite difficult when you're surrounded by people that think the height of spirituality is being beaten, whipped to death and thanking the abusers and, you know, giving them the other cheek to slap and whatever else Jesus recommends. Uh, I, I I tend to side with Krishna and Arjuna or with like the Viking lore, you know, if, if especially for self-defense, you need to be, like they said, the um, it's better to be a, a, a warrior in the garden than a gardener in a war. <laughs> you need to be able to defend yourself and your family and your ideas and your way of life in case somebody tries to infringe on that and if they do what are you just going to roll over like what what is that as a man or even a woman or, or or a child it having integrity and believing in your own way of living that's that's fine and nobody should be able to infringe on that and if they do for you to be an effective member of society you need to be able to stand your ground and be able to defend your way of living otherwise you're just a pushover and whoever the evilist psychopath is who doesn't have those kind of qualms you know that's the problem is the, the people in charge the elites the psychopaths the richest most powerful people in charge they don't have these compassionate empathic qualms they don't worry about what 
you know, your family and, and your friends and your community is going to think. They, they're international. They live in castles. They have private jets. You know, people like that, who are the people that really run society, have a whole different way of being and thinking than we do. And that's what puts us on the back foot. Psychopaths are impossible to um, make non make them non-psychopaths. They've tried for centuries. Psych psychologists, they've found nothing. The, the Most psychology books, they have one sentence about um, therapy when it comes to psychopaths. And that is that there's, so far none has been found. There is no, you can't not be, be a psychopath. You are born that way. And that's why I think um, ancient people would talk about reptilian shape-shifting and that there was a reptilian race of humans. They look like humans, but they're not. And you can see it in their eyes. If you're very intuitive, you can notice um, energy patterns of people. And you will notice, because we are a physical manifestation of our consciousness as well, so there are physical cues to psychopaths, as well as obvious mental and situational cues that if you hang out with them long enough, it becomes obvious. Um, but people of a pastime or, or more right-brained, they would call it a race, a reptilian race in the sense of it, it's genetic, it's it's nature, not nurture, psych psychopathy. And though uh, it pops, it's like a deformity basically because it's, it's not like, oh, you're a psychopath, your kid's definitely going to be a psychopath, their kid's going to be a psychopath. It does have a genetic tendency, but it can also pop up in families that don't have a history of it as well. So it's some kind of strange inherent deviation that exists here in this realm, similar to predators that I've criticized before. I, I have this, I have this thing about uh, a lot of these negative elements of this realm that I wonder whether a fully benevolent creator truly is on the table here. Like most of the religions say that uh, this this realm, this thing that we're all experiencing here, was created by a fully benevolent god that wants nothing more. Than the best for us. This, this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. The, whole soul, the whole soul trap thing. Uh, it, uh, yeah, what, forever conscious research, man. I, you turned me on to him, and I started watching. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know. I was like, the the kind of is the end of of what can be scientifically uh, evaluated. Right, just from the the enormous amount of, of testimonials and evidence that this guy's gone through, and then him just taking the complete opposite approach to interpreting it, it's like at first I was like, oh man, this is depressing, yeah. and then it's like I'll go back and listen to him every once in a while, and it's like now it just makes me laugh. It's like that's so funny. This guy might be right, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, but like so, I kind of want to start back at, at the beginning of, of that segment where because mm. you just. I like, just went on a tangent. Yeah, my apologies. Just, well, you just read my mind. Rain yeah. me in. Rain me in. I went too far. <laughs> no, you just went typical full Dubai on it as far as I'm concerned. And and literally the notes that I've been making the last few days that were the key points I wanted to discuss, you just covered them all, right? <laughs> Start. Okay, so starting with when when you mentioned that you had the, the audacity to, to make a documentary called Jesus Christ Never Existed, right? It was... Like when you first came out with it, I watched it and I was like, oh, God, that's hard for me to watch. I was raised Christian. My mom was a Catholic school kindergarten teacher. You know, I was all into it. Like I went to Catholic private school when I was in elementary school. And then when we moved to Texas, like still kept going to CCD classes and was a confirmed Catholic when I was 16 or whatever. And and I was like, oh, my God, Eric's like really done it this time when Jesus Christ didn't exist. Like I have to honestly consider this possibility. You know, and then it's like I could only I, I watched it once, maybe twice. And I was like, wow, there was a lot of really good points made in that one. You know, like, holy moly. So the first time we've ever heard of this guy was 50 years from Josephus, like a Roman Jewish scholar or whatever, 50 years after he allegedly existed. And, and, and it just goes on from there. It was like I finally got to the point where I was like, OK, I'm just going to watch this until like as much as I can. I can I can own this information and not be reacting to it emotionally. And so I finally got there. And then you came out with the uh, the Bible's hidden meanings. And to me right now, currently, I think that's the most like. Uh, 
it's the most meaningful to me because what you did in that one. So I'm also in the same boat as you. Is like I, I've read the Bible cover to cover twice, right? And and it didn't make any sense to me the first time. I was like, I, I you know, I did it out of like dutiful, like I'm just going to sit down every night. And I think it took me a year to get through it the first time, like not rushing, like really focusing on every word and trying to understand it and like doing it. And I was like, okay, after after a year of that, none of that made any sense to me. You know, like I get thou shalt not kill and. I get the things that you're telling me directly and all this, but clearly that that's not what was being said here. And all of these different interpretations of it to me end up in this nonsense, like just unuseful. It just just wasn't useful information. And, and so I was like, okay, let me read this thing again. And so I did it and had the exact same results. I think I only took like, you know, I, I read it real slow and conscientiously again over like a couple of months, I think, and and went through it again. And then I just kind of shelved it because I was like, I don't get it. You know, and then you find out about like the Council of Nicaea and, you know, like literally half the books being removed and uh, like all of it, you know, and, and it's like, what what is going on there, right? And so when, when the Bible's Hidden Meanings came out, it was like, boom, just huge light bulb went on. It was like, oh, because what I basically got and continue, you know, I still got, I need to watch it 10 more times before I'll really have the information like internalized and grasped. But like what, what I pulled from it was that all of these various religions, whether they be Buddhists or, uh, you know, Indian the, with the Bhagavad Gita's or, uh, you know, Christianity or like the, these main main religions it seems to be that the i i might be using words i shouldn't but like the esoteric like occult hidden message of of all these things to me seem to be and i again i've only read the bible so i'm not familiar with the other books other than basically what i've heard about them uh the quran like uh, you know i've got muslim friends in town and but basically what i pulled out of the bible's hidden meanings was that this whole thing's an allegory for, you know, the, the seven chakra centers, right? And so, like, thou shalt not sin means, like, okay, like, break down the concept of sin into, like, trying to do right, you know, starting down, like, you know, in your, your pelvic region with, like, don't be sexually bad, you know, and then moving up, like, you know, try and master what you consume and try and work on your breath and try and work on, like, what goes into your throat and what comes out of your mouth and what you're thinking. And then once you actually get all this done— then eventually the sacred secretion can happen and everything changes for you, right? So I've never, like, I don't know that I've ever had, like, uh, I don't know that I have or that I haven't had, like, a chakra experience, like, uh, as far as the pineal gland goes, like, I'm not sure, right? Which, Which means to me, like, okay, I still have a lot of work to do. But... For me, that was what I pulled out of the Bible's hidden meanings was like, that's what the book's telling everybody to do is like focus on, on you know, and, and the chakras being like a good way to break down where you can go wrong in each of the most important areas of life. Right. And it was like, OK, I think I'm getting this now. Like and so that's the direction I see myself moving in is trying to, to understand and apply the, the teachings. But I don't even think I have to learn anything. I just have to actually be self-disciplined enough to do what I already know to be correct. And it's the same for everybody else, right? And so it was like, yeah, after the the Jesus didn't exist one, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, just, I was like, oh, when's Dubai gonna stop? He's killing me, you know? And it was like, the Bible's hidden meanings. And I was like, oh, I was like, this is so good. And it's something I can, so anytime like really, like Christian people come to me, and they're like, you know, the Bible says the Earth's flat. Like, yeah, I know. There's over 300 different references to the cosmology, shape, non-motion, yada yada. Like, you know, I'm pretty familiar with the book. Uh, but you need to watch this documentary. You need to see the Bible's hidden meanings so that you understand, like, what you're actually like, what is trying to like tell you. It was just written in a way that was easy for them to pass down over long periods of time without it becoming too corrupted, mm-hmm. you know. And so it uh, then leads into the whole idea of, of uh, that I never took seriously before then, which was reincarnation. You know, it was just kind of this weird 
funny idea that I, you know, had heard about and this and that. And then after you spend a few weeks or a couple of months really allowing the, the concept to be like, have I been here before? Like, what's the possibility I've been here before? And then you sit down and watch a little forever conscious research, like break it down. And you're like, oh, like there's people that have, have put serious time, you know, and then you find out there's like studies that ran over decades, you know, really proving reincarnation seems to happen beyond like any reasonable doubt, you know, like, and it's like, oh my gosh, which then leads you right into like this whole soul trap concept. And I loved how you put it one time. You're like, well, if we are in some sort of soul, tra- uh, this is, I'm paraphrasing really badly, so I apologize. But you were like, what I'm trying to do is master karma. So if karma is real and all these things, like I'm really trying to win the karma game. And that seems to be like absolutely the safest bet, you know, as far as like benefits for the world around you, benefits for yourself, the possibility of of dealing with this soul trap thing, you know, if and when, hopefully it doesn't come down to like, after we're not in these bodies anymore, like, you know, they, they unleash the matrix marketing department on us and talk us into going into the light and we get recycled. I mean, who don't, who knows? Right. But I at least try and keep it in my mind so that, uh, when, when the time does inevitably come, I guess, like, yeah, I don't plan on uh, consenting, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I'm going to hold out and just stare at them. Like, what are you talking about? Right. Like, and then just yeah, see what happens. MO seems to be right. to try and make us feel guilty. Everyone from the, their yeah. near death experience or people that have done uh, psychedelics and brought them to this or, or hypnotic regression, brought them to the in between life state, all these different ways of, of trying to find out what might happen there. There is a lot of similarity of experience. And what people find is that there's this judgment, this life review. My whole life flashed before my eyes. And while the life is flashing before your eyes, there's angels or family, old dead family members or something like this there to kind of nudge you through this life review journey. And they highlight certain parts of your life that tend to be parts where you could have done better, parts where your karma wasn't all the way up, up to par, so to speak. And then what they tell you is that, well, all you got to do is go into this light and then you'll be born again and have the opportunity to right all those wrongs. And then you'll, you know, graduate from this karma system into somewhere better. Hmm. But then they wipe your memory. If if you start over again, that's like failing your your um, SATs or something. And then being like, well, you're going to start over at kindergarten again with a mind wipe. You know, a little men in black yeah. <laughs> mind wipe. And then and then, then after 12 more years of schooling, then we'll see if you can, maybe you'll pass it then. And it's like, all right, well, at the well, very least, if you're going to make me start over again from kindergarten to see if I pass this test to get into the better place, let me keep my education. <laughs> why yeah. would you why would you get rid of all of the knowledge that I've acquired over this lifetime and then have me start again from scratch with the idea that then maybe you'll you'll improve next time next time you'll get out. It's like that only Unless makes there's... that only makes sense if you don't wipe my memories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so it leads one after contemplating it for a while to be like, wow. Like the the only reason that would happen, and there'd be so many reports of people having their memories wiped basically, and then through regression and various things like remembering what yeah, like the whole thing would be if it is if there's something to that whole soul trap concept. And it's mm. like, oh geez. But I don't know. I'm not trying to get stuck. Like we obviously, I'll follow. But it's one of my favorite like, subjects currently, honestly, because okay. it's I like religion and and this well, the exploration of world religion and just philosophizing myself is what has brought me to the what they call the soul trap. I, I'd already kind of been there before I'd even heard that term. I wasn't fully convinced that we were created by a hundred percent benevolent entity that wants nothing but the best for all of his creations or whatever. It just doesn't seem like that way. It seems like we're in a very yin yang thing here. It's black and white, there's up and down, there's male and female, there's sun and moon, there's day and night, there's inhale and exhale, there's good and evil. There's nothing about this realm makes me think that it's the singularity, meaning heaven, the bestest place in the universe, or hell, the worstest place imaginable. It doesn't really seem like either to me 
to me, it seems like we're in an in-between place, some kind of purgatory, you might want to call it, or something of that nature, where either it's a prison or a school. And that seems to be the competing ideas. Most all religious people, even non-religious people, seem to have this idea that life is kind of like a school and you need to get your karma up, whether they call it that or they call it sin. You know, Christians focus on the, the opposite. Because karma, even karma now, people think that karma means bad karma. <laughs> like, oh, karma came back and got you. Well, good karma comes back and helps you too. It's, it's not a, <laughs> karma is not a one-sided coin. Um, but yeah, so if, if karma is the ultimate thing that allows you into heaven, I still don't agree with it. I think that that's, you know, if you're a perfect God and you can create any thing that you want so that you can send subjective, subjective packets of consciousness into a world that you create as supposedly is happening here. That's what even all religious people basically think is that we were breathed life into the dust of the earth more more metaphors don't take it literally you know god has a mouth and he breathed and then adam you know but again they, they take these things so literally it's like any sentence you can break it down and see that it, it's not literal this is a storification way of talking about things that are happen in the realm of consciousness you don't you don't breathe life into dust and then create a conscious human with agency but you might dream it so if you are the you know brahma the the all dreaming all objective consciousness then the only thing you could do is dream so everything that happens happens within your consciousness and again that's the hindu um version uh, you know to to think that everything that we're experiencing is in the mind of god even our physicality that we take to be so physical <laughs> we take it to be so real yeah. it's not real in that in that sense it's no more real than the characters in a dream or the places you visit in a dream they seem real the characters are interacting with the thing they can touch it they can pick it up they can throw it it's it's real in that sense but when you wake up from the dream which is when you die then you see that that all was the, the all the physical realness that you thought was so real is less real than your consciousness so the consciousness becomes the real thing now. Now that your body dies and you lift out of it, this is what near-death experiencers and hypnotic regression patients and, and uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, psychedelic entheogen practitioners that go deep in ayahuasca and peyote and some of these strong psychedelics, they get to places where they can no longer identify with their physical body or who they were or are laying there out of it. They're in a whole new thing a new place, a new realm with consciousness. And it often involves this, what we're talking about, dead relatives or angels showing you your life and then judging you based on it and then ushering you towards your next life, your next journey based on whatever those judgments are. But the other bit of it is that you do have a say. You're not just some puppet on a, on a people mover if going through the afterlife and and they're forcing you into that white light no if you actually have the agency and the inkling to question them and to stand up for yourself and to, to to question the whole system of karma and their little things they're trying to guilt trip you in about your life you know maybe you tried your best and that's why i'm saying i'm trying my best if karma truly is the mechanism i want to be able to say to those people that look i stopped eating all meat you know, you tried to force me into a system where there's predators and prey and 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 all and everyone around me is is doing this way, and then I tried to absolve myself of that karma. You know, same with the globe thing. And I found out an egregious lie of all like all of history, and I made it my life mission to try and tell the truth about it so that everybody isn't deluded anymore. You know, I. And well, that I mean, I'm a good son. I'm a good grandson. I, I try to be a good person to everyone that I meet. And hopefully, if I got to that state and there was dead relatives and angels trying to pick my life apart and try to find whatever the most, the worst part of my life was and say, look, see, 
now you have to live all over again and memory wipe you, or you have to go to hell. Well, who, who knows? That's what Christians might think. Whatever it is, I don't necessarily agree. And I'm going to, like you said, I'm not going to consent. I'm not just going to be like, okay, all right, I guess, yeah. You know, like I was saying, mm-hmm. I, I don't do that. I'm not into the giving you another cheek to slap me after I'm already down. I like to stand up for myself. You know, <laughs> I, I teach martial arts. I teach self-defense. I think that that's the time to use physicality is to defend. That's what I'm, I'm defending the flat earth here, or, you know, you're, def, you're defending, let's say that you're protecting. As a vegan, you become a protector of animals rather than a predator of them. Your whole life now is, is dedicated to not harming them. And your whole being, everywhere you go, every time you go to a restaurant or you go to the supermarket, you're voting for plants. <laughs> you're voting for compassion with your money. Every time you're not voting for people to go to a slaughterhouse and kill on your behalf so that you can have a ham sandwich. You're going to have a veggie sandwich. Instead, nobody needs to die and you're healthier for it. And you've become a protector of these these beings on the earth and and take it all the way to the soul trap. Yeah, at the end of your life, if somebody's trying to guilt trip you into coming back to this hellscape because you didn't do the perfectest job ever... A, you try to do the best you can. You try to win that karma game if you can. And then B, as long as you know that that's what you did and you genuinely put out the best effort that you could, stand on that ground in the afterlife when they're trying to make you feel guilty and trying to tell you to do this or that. Well, aren't I sovereign? Can't I do whatever I want? How about I don't do any of what you say and I try to create my own realm? Or, you know, how about I'll stay here for a while? I'm going to see what's happening. When you leave your body, people find that you can travel at the speed of sound. You can access knowledge and memories at that point that you couldn't, you know, you forget what happened. I don't remember anything before I was five years old. A lot of people, when they leave their body, all those memories come back. They see it like a clear as day. So it seems like our bodies are like a funnel, a filter of consciousness, and they make us forget certain things or or not have access to certain things. And then once you're out of the body, you just think somewhere you can be there and you can experience it because that's the nature of consciousness it's not limited to the physicality if you think something why couldn't you be there if you're the dreamer of the dream and you think something of course you can be there um and i think once we're out of these physical bodies we come a step closer to that dreamer once we don't have an uh, association and identity with a physical form anymore because we know we've died and now we're just a point of consciousness in this new space and it they, as Mark from Forever Conscious Research constantly points out, is that they they don't let you be in that state for long. It's like oh. it's like you're dangerous in that state. You're you're coming to know your true power outside of your body, and so they quickly come and uh, corral you into paying attention to whatever they want you to pay attention to. Their little life review or show you parts of the afterlife that that they want you to see. Um, well, why can't I? Similar to like Antarctica, but why can't I go see for myself? Why are you just telling me? Oh, it's a globe. It's a little continent on the bottom. You don't fall off because of gravity. You're good. Don't bother going there. Well, why can't I go and see? I want to go there and check it out for myself, and then I'll decide. Can't we? Can't we do that? It's the same thing they're doing with most everything. Religion as well. It's like I don't want to pick a religion. I, none of them are conclusive. None of them have absolute proof to show that this is absolutely true. And at the exclusion of all these other religions making all of them false. Nobody's made a claim that, that that's that conclusive because you're talking about afterlife and, and immaterial things, things that you couldn't possibly have direct experience of and convince another person of it. So it's real subjective, religion and these kind of subjects, which is why I refuse to conclude anything. I'm going to be you know, on my deathbed, and then afterwards I'll be in that conveyor belt with them on the, the karma train trying to get me to life review, and I'm still going to be in this state of, like, agnosticism. Like, what is going on? What is this? What is it? Where Versus, like, what seems to happen is, like, Christians often in their life review, Jesus shows up. And they know it's Jesus. They're sure it's Jesus. Of course it's Jesus, this light being. And he talks kind of like Jesus, and he, or, or what I've pictured to be and, but what seems to be, as you look at these life reviews taken as a whole, is that these beings, these dead relatives, aliens, uh, angels, demons, they 
are shapeshifters in the sense that they seem to appear as whatever would be the most influential to you. So if you're a Christian, then yeah, the afterlife being... 200 foot being Jesus. A, yeah. yeah, a 200 foot <laughs> Jesus, exactly. A 15 foot Jesus. They, they often say that. It's like a giant Jesus too, because that's even more authoritative. Uh, and then if you just go along with whatever they say, well, then you're going to be recycled, it seems. That's what happens. We're in like a recycling plant here. The only way that you can get out of it is to maintain your sovereignty and stand up to these beings that are come going to come in the form of whatever would be most influential to you. If you were really close to your grandmother, then maybe your grandmother is going to come and tell you that your karma wasn't quite good enough and that you should walk into the light and because and, that's going to work for you or whatever. So, yeah, it's quite an interesting subject. Um, but my what I love about this is that nobody is an authority on it and nobody can be an authority on it. People try to do that with religion and we poke holes in it. When you talk about the, your actual afterlife experience, the idea of a soul trap or, or anything like that, who, who can claim to be an authority? Even near-death experiencers are not an authority because they only nearly died. <laughs> they didn't actually die. <laughs> yeah, but then you also have that body of research that, you know, were uh, allegedly went on for decades and there was like 30 or 40,000 cases of them confirming reincarnation. So you're totally right. I was thinking the same thing. You know, it's like, how do we know? Because they didn't actually die. They came back. So can we trust this? But then you combine it. If that study's real, you know, I haven't dug that deep into it to know, but it would seem right that, that the information exists and that it like you know i think i spent maybe half a day digging into like okay are there really this many like documented cases of of children remembering past lives and i remember thinking like okay i can accept that as as a data point right and so when you combine both of them together it's like i don't know you know it's definitely a very oh, yeah. interesting subject absolutely and so I'm, yeah. I, and I get, and I'm with you there. I don't come to conclusions, but I will, like I said, I don't like black and white, but I like to be on a very light shade of gray. I like to go real close to one side that, because that's, that's what usually what happens. It, the evidence is going to point towards one side or the other, but somebody that's not too dogmatic about it doesn't need it to be 100% or 0%. And that's kind of my Taoist way of approaching everything. Eric, if... You found evidence that the Earth truly was a globe. Would you be able to go back to being a glober? Sure. If if there was evidence. <laughs> what are you talking of course. About? <laughs> it's the only reason I became a flat earther is because all the evidence points to flat earth. So yes, I, I would. But the point is, it's not. That's why I'm a flat earther. <laughs> I, I didn't yeah. I didn't just over like flip a switch. Like, oh, I'm a flat earther now. Yeah, <laughs> I looked into it a lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so okay, so the other thing that, that kind of moving away from that a little bit. How did you, so I was telling you earlier, like, uh, you know, I played a lot of sports growing up. And so I got really into wrestling. And, and I remember when I was in high school, that was like, I, I just wanted that skill set. You know, I wanted to, to be able to, to, you know, with push came to shove, win the pushing and the shoving match. And, uh, and found wrestling to be like uh, kind of awesome you know, as far as like self-defense methods go, right? Yeah, and so I remember when I was first watching your videos, trying to get to know you, it, uh, I was like, what is this guy? He's into yoga and he's a vegan and this and this. And then when I finally understood you were into, I'm not trying to, Wing Chun, is that the correct pronunciation? I uh, do other martial arts as well, but that's kind of the main one else? that I focus on. Oh, I've done, I've done judo, I've done jujitsu, I've done Muay Thai. Uh, I've nice. second degree black belt in Taekwondo, um, lots, lots of different, uh, Kali as well, uh, knife, knife fighting, stick fighting, done quite a bit, um, but Wing Chun is the main focus, I ca similar to Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee started with Wing Chun, and uh, over the course of his life, he said that he developed Jeet Kune Do, which was a, a much more open system where you take, he would say, uh, like, uh, uh, what did he say, absorb what you can from everything, um, discard what is useless and and find what's uniquely your own. 
it's like a three-step process for and, and i've used that not just for martial arts but for religion and pretty much everything else you can imagine first you got to study everything that's out there because if you just pick one and be like oh i'm a karate guy and then you go all into karate all the way you're never going to know everything else and you're just going to think karate is the absolute best thing ever because that, that's all your experience is and I basically did that with Taekwondo. Everybody basically does that with your first martial art. You got to pick one and then you get so into it that you think that it's the best until you find something outside of it and truly explore that option. And then you know, your horizons open to the point we've done in history to the point we've got now this thing called MMA, mixed martial arts. And we've pretty much determined that that's what you got to do if you're going to be a legit martial artist. You can't just pick one and be like, this is the best one. At the exclusion of all others, similar to like I said with the religion, you can't just pick one and be like, this religion is all the truth and everything outside it is wrong and, and the Antichrist, so don't even look at it. It's like, no, like you got to study all these martial arts and you'll find that basically what it is, is they're all part of one big system that's been fragmented. Judo is the standing throw game. Jiu-jitsu is what you do with the guy on the ground after they've been thrown on the ground to submit them. You know, Muay Thai is the the eight limbs. It's the elbows, knees, feet, and and fists. It's, it's the main striking capabilities. Well, the head is another one they, they took out from Muay Thai, but it was in the Lao version, the Cambodian version. And, and that's the striking arts. And, the, and then you've got, um, you know, yogas, for instance. That's all part of it. The, uh, martial arts started as meditation, and the monks were falling asleep, so they started doing moving meditations, incorporating animal motions, which turned into self-defense applications which turned into the modern day martial arts but the whole purpose of even starting the motions was to maintain a meditative focus so and it's the same with yoga if you read the ancient yoga uh, sutras the whole point in yoga is meditation it's not even stretching or balancing or strengthening poses and all this stuff that's popularized the whole point in yoga is to be able to maintain a singular focus without wavering just it's, it's just mental and emotional focus staying calm and relaxed in all situations and being able to focus on one thing without being distracted by a whole bunch of crap. That's yoga. That's the heart of yoga. Um, but, you know, it's been packaged in so many different ways that a lot of people don't even realize that that's what yoga started as, similar to martial arts. Martial arts started as meditation. And so for me, meditation, yoga, martial arts, um, those are all the same thing. But for a lot of people, they think I'm involved in like all these disparate hobbies and activities it's like but the from spirituality to the like all of these things they're the all veganism connected. even it's all connected um but if you're on what? a different life path a different train you're on the carnivore path and then i don't know you who knows i don't want to go there but there's different philosophies and ways of thinking of ways of thinking of manhood even and 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 then you live that way to the exclusion of everything else and this is what i'm talking about uh, trying not to be black and so black and white about things that's what's got us divided and conquered the whole republican democrat christian muslim all these divisions that none of them are real or necessary the the realist thing is that we're all involved in this ineffable realm that we don't know the shape of it and we don't know how we got here or where we're going so acting like we've got these authority figures and these religions and holy books telling us these things like but you don't know nobody knows it's, we need to get back to that state where people just accept humbly that we really don't know these things. We don't even know what happens when you go straight for 24 hours in a plane. <laughs> we're, we're so, we're, we have no idea what, what is going on in this realm, but all of us love pumping our chests up and acting like we know exactly everything from the afterlife realm to, you know, uh, Arcturus and, and Betelgeuse and all these little lights in the sky that they're going to tell you are bigger than the entire earth and there's aliens living on them and they're going to come knock on your door in 2030. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, uh, yeah, uh, the whole, if, if, every, if anybody watching this hasn't like zoomed in on, on Sirius yet or Sirius, however you say that star, it's mm. definitely the most interesting one, and I find it the easiest one to actually get in focus for the P900. So yeah. I definitely recommend like checking that out. Uh, yeah. But the reason I brought up Wing Chun was because I found like when I started watching your videos, I was like, "What is this weird martial art he's into?" 
you know, and I was like, okay, let's see what's going on here. And I started watching them. And then I realized like a ton of those, because it's just, it's so devastating, right? So a ton of those techniques are exactly what they teach in the military for close quarters combat. Right. Right. It's li- like just brutal. Like I got you know, yeah. Like, you know, and yeah, I, like one, one of the main things. Yeah, exactly. And they're taken how, out of know, all competitive you're... martial arts because, of course, you can't be competitively gouging people's eyes and nice kneeing yeah, them in the groin and and doing throat chops and things like this. But when you when you take that out, suddenly you're no longer doing self defense, true self defense. Now you're doing sport self defense sport. where there's rules and there's sportsmanship, which is fine. It's good. You need that. And being involved in that sport helps you in the self-defense aspects. The problem is, is again, people are taking the the finger instead of the moon, and they're like, they're thinking that, oh, well, this system, this MMA system, because this is the new thing. Now, I like mixed martial arts, truly mixed martial arts. But what has happened in the past 20 years since UFC came around and jujitsu took over is they decided that MMA basically means only four martial arts. <laughs> Boxing, Muay Thai, jiu-jitsu, and wrestling. Now, these are they're all great. I would recommend everybody that wants to be a serious martial artist should do all four of those. And that's So I'm not disagreeing with any of that. However, if you want to be a formidable, empty hands uh, fighter on the street, not just in a ring, you absolutely need, say, Kali, Wing Chun, Silat, or some of these other uh, martial arts that are, they, they don't have these rule based focuses. And they do do weapons, empty hand versus weapons, or weapons versus weapons, because and multiple attackers. You know, MMA, UFC, they cater towards one attacker with no weapons, in a ring, with rules, uh, who, and there's like time limits, and it's all of this stuff that if you're truly training for life to, you know, self-defense, um, life and death situations like uh, the military does. You know, a lot of Wing Chun teachers teach in the military. Uh, there's, it's versus say, uh, you know, Taekwondo or something like that, where you're just kicking all the time. It's not a particularly practical martial art if it's all you know. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to supplement and become the best kicker you can be, Taekwondo is it. You know, as a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. I would love it to have been the end all be all. And I kind of thought that way as a teenager until I came across a Wing Chun guy that kicked my ass. <laughs> That's why I, I, started, <laughs> like, oh, I started learning yeah. under him instead. Show me some of that. Um, and, uh, I don't know, I... But, but everything, I mean, wrestling, as you said, wrestling is absolutely formidable. And it's one of my personal um, uh, holes. You know, everybody's got a hole in their game. And for me, wrestling is one I've never actually, I've taken jujitsu and judo, but never wrestling. Um, and I can see that it's, you know, the, the explosive power and the ability to control the other person and to maintain your own balance while in a grappling situation on the feet, that's where wrestling shines. It's very similar to judo, but much more, much more machismo. And like judo is a lot more, um, they use geese usually, and you're able to kind of use the soft touch to, to avoid throws whereas wrestling it's much more hard on hard you know there's not much soft force other than if you can feel say the the guy's going too hard then you can you you know you switch similar sumo or other all forms of wrestling do that same thing there's no there is no hard only form of martial art all martial arts have a hard and soft you know yin and yang bit ultimately the hard strike or whatever is the thing that wins the fight But the soft element needs to be there as well because you can't always impose your will during a fight. At some point, the other guy is going to to be more effective. You you have to be on. It's like uh, playing chess, kind of. Sometimes you're on the the advance, and when you are, you always want to try to continue making him react to you on the chessboard. And it's similar when you're in a a fight situation. You want to be offensive. True self defense is offense. <laughs> if you're defending yourself, you're losing. That's called losing. <laughs> and that's why Wing Chun doesn't really, they don't have blocks, so to speak. We have shapes that we do with our arms, but they're in.
shapes to receive the other person's arm and then to use that tactile information, the sensitivity to then stay stuck. They call it sticky hands. They stay stuck to their limbs, but then go towards their center. So I'll, I'll, I'll as you punch, I'll meet your limb. I'll come from the center line. Everything in Wing Chun comes off the center line and then goes out accordingly. And so you're going to if you're doing a center punch, I'll do a central punch. I don't block it. I punch the same time you punch. And then our punches block each other. It's not going to get through. And then if you're obsessively focused on the center like Wing Chun is, you continue your strike towards the center. And if that one doesn't get through, well, your second chain punch, you, you one of the main strikes is this chain punch. It goes right over the center. So you will barrel through the center of the other guy unless he's a better chain puncher than you, which never happens because nobody trains Wing Chun. Very good. All yep. they do, they see it, and then they're like, what is that? That is the stupidest looking punch. You can't punch people like that. That's not how it works. We don't punch people like, well, some of them, some shitty Wing Chun practitioners do. They'll like, they'll just run at you like this, thinking that's that's Wing Chun. But it's not. The, the chain punch, what happens is, it's what happens after or during when you're making contact. Everything about Wing Chun is about the center line, and it's all about offense. So what is the number one center line offense? Well, it's the, this chain punch right down the center. And also, in, in Wing Chun, we use three limbs at a time. You only have to stand on one leg. You don't have to have both legs on the ground. So one of them is kicking towards the opponent's knees at the same time that you're punching at their head. And like a steamroller effect, you put that foot down, and you can now kick with the next foot. So you can come forward with a central attack on three limbs constantly. And most people have never dealt with that, even martial artists, because they're not used to Wing Chun people or what they do. And a lot of Wing Chun people don't branch out into MMA, so they're not really good representatives of the art. They're, they're focused only on Wing Chun, and then and most Wing Chun schools don't do any sparring, which is ridiculous. Thinking that you can be a formidable self-defense practitioner, but you never spar. <laughs> they just do chi sao and, and pre-planned techniques and stuff. Like, that's not okay. I mean, from the first day with all my students, we always spar. Almost half of the, the lesson is sparring. Um, but start with Wing Chun principles, techniques, forms, drills, and then you slowly work your way into freestyle sparring. Every, le I, I, every lesson works that way, starting with more focused, intentional tasks and then getting out to freestyle to the, and then it, like just punches even, freestyle punch only boxing. And then you add the legs and then you add the elbows and the knees and everything. And that's how you can, um, you know, to turn it into a system that is actually worthwhile rather than I'm, I'm saying p people often narrow their focus into one system rather than expanding and seeing, like I said, Bruce Lee did absorb what's useful, reject what's useless and create what's uniquely your own because we're all different too. I'm a six foot two lanky dude. You know, what works really good for me was Taekwondo. If I can keep people away with my long legs away from anything else, it's the perfect strategy. And so and it worked great for me. I did very, very well with Taekwondo. But if you can get past my long legs, I suddenly had no answer to it. And that's the Wing Chun guy. Um, he would, I'd try to <laughs> kick him and he would parry the kick, get into my center line, punch me down on the ground every time to the point that it was like, it was kind of silly. It's like, what am I doing here? Uh, I clearly had a, the biggest hole imaginable in my game that nobody previously had exploited because I was mostly only going to competitions against other Taekwondo, Karate, and Kung Fu guys, not Wing Chun, but other Kung Fu. So, and that expanded my world. And then Jiu Jitsu came along and that's another, I mean, Jiu Jitsu is absolutely fundamental. I had no idea about that until I learned about it. And again, if you don't know that, you're going to get caught in that. You need to know Jiu Jitsu at least to defend yourself against people who know <laughs> Jiu Jitsu. Otherwise, you're, you're done for. Um, in multiple attacker situations or with weapons or a lot of things, jujitsu is just not going to work. It's another problem, though. It's it's praised as if it's the end-all, be-all. And it pretty much is if you're in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, unarmed fight against someone who also doesn't know jujitsu, you're probably going to win. But with a bunch of other factors around, like, you know, usually somebody's got a friend around waiting to kick the snot out of you or he's got a knife in his back pocket or something that there's force equalizers that uh, jiu-jitsu is actually one of the worst for because you're you're on the ground usually. Most of their stuff is done on the ground. You're tied up with one person 
And if there's a second person, you're screwed. So jujitsu is one of the worst for multiple attackers and weapons as well. With weapons, you don't, you don't want to be in the situation. Unless you have a weapon yourself that you're better at using than they are, your best, in all self-defense situations, your best bet is leaving the area, always. And MMA people aren't training that way. They're training to be stuck in a cage with someone until they submit or are knocked out. Wing Chun was invented by a woman. The whole idea is to get the heck out of there as fast as possible, striking whatever the most vulnerable targets are with your strongest weapons. So for them, it's kneeing some guy in the groin or poking him in the eyes with your fingers. And we get really good at it. I mean, I do a little joke with my students all the time. It's like, you try to punch me and I'm going to poke you in the eyes and we're going to see who wins. And nobody can punch me. Everyone's going to be, you're going to be too concerned about the fact that I'm poking you right and I'll, I'll let them wear goggles okay. so we can really so we can really do it actually trained yeah but if you have it doesn't take much training and this is why and ever i don't know if it's you watch much ufc but yeah. john john jones is notorious for he's got a long reach and he puts his fingers out and he pokes people accidentally pokes people in the eyes all the time he's one of the most dominant ufc fighters in all of history and he's his opponents hate this about him is that he gets away with poking people in the eyes all the time he's got these really long legs and really long arms like me and it's it's a really good thing you can do if your limbs are longer than your opponent and then you're doing this versus this and all you need to do is a, a, a bilgy the strike it's like this it's like a flick can't really see it it's too fast that's the whole point it's so fast you can't even see it unlike a punch which you can see the whole time this flick to the eyes it it hurts a lot i mean i've i've had it happen to me on accident and it's painful and it it puts the fight out of you completely like you, you thought you wanted to fight the second somebody pokes your eye back into your skull you are just like oh my god all you care about is your vision and the, uh, am i blind now did i just become blind right now and i, I mean even if you were in a life or death situation that action and and that's, that's i mean i'm not just gonna end there that's just that's that's how I get in. That's my center line strike. I strike in your center line in your eyes so that you close them and you you go like this, and then I continue chain punching, kneeing in the groin, elbow strikes, headbutt. That, I mean that's the normal progression when you get in. The the Wing Chun guy. The first thing we want to do is to have you strike our limbs. So you do whatever you want. That's why they usually start like this. If you ever seen traditional Wing Chun, they just go like this and like they don't strike first. You strike first, but then our block is a strike which is going to get to you before your strike gets to us. So you do a hook, well, I just do a straight punch. It's gonna block your hook and it's gonna get to your face before you do. You do a straight punch, I do a straight punch. It's gonna cross your straight punch like this and because I obsessively train for the center line all the time, your arm is gonna go slightly off the center line and not hit me. And my arm is gonna go straight on the center line and hit you. Because that's Wing Chun is obsessively focused on this center line theory. And it's one of the greatest things about Wing Chun, and it's why I promote it um, over some of the other martial arts. Like I said, uh, I'm kind of like Bruce Lee, where he said, what I do is 50% Wing Chun and 50% everything else. That's basically what I teach, because I've found Wing Chun to be, on its own, the most effective. But it's not, like, like every martial art, it's not a complete system on its own. You really do need to branch out and dedicate yourself to the other martial arts as well so that you can be a holistic fighter and actually have those holes in your game patched up before you start promoting yourself as Wing Chun versus Muay Thai and then get yourself creamed going forward with the chain punch and you don't, you've never sparred a day in your life. That's, that's the main problem I see with Wing Chun in modern times is that they don't spar and they don't do other martial arts. So the, most of the Wing Chun people all they know is Wing Chun, and they don't spar against themselves or against other martial arts. So they're just, they're in a um, echo chamber. And it's a great martial art, and the, the philosophy behind it's amazing, but it's got to catch up to modern times. It's, it's got to be integrated with MMA. And there are a few Wing Chun teachers that are doing that, and it's it's great when, when you do that. They're, um, they're creating fighters that are on a different caliber and they're they're good at a different type of fighting like i'm saying it's not cage fighting that this is about this is about survival it's about empty hand survival <laughs> yeah that's why I, I i brought it up because when when 
when I was like, okay, what martial art is he into? And I didn't realize you were that well versed in that many different martial arts, but it uh, the combination for me of of wrestling and then you know that little bit of QCQ or close quarters combat that that I got with my brief you know military career or whatever. Uh, as soon as I saw that first Win Chung video, I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what what I was taught. You know, close quarters combat. In the military. Exactly. That's where most and, close quarter combat and, systems originate with is Kali or Wing Chun because they are the the main close quarter combat systems in the world. That it's the main um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, range that they fight in close quarters. A lot of karate, boxing, taekwondo. It's all about ranged ranged attacks. Like I said, I'm good with my long legs, trying to keep people at range, which is why my big hole was when the Wing Chun guy could come in past my long legs. All the world, Wing Chun is all about dominating the center line and being being and staying close in. A, a boxer, a Wing Chun, um, a boxer, a Taekwondo, a karate guy, you watch them fight. They're going to jockey in and out, in and out, in and out. You watch a Wing Chun guy fight, it's just in. And again, in and out is good for sport fighting and for sparring. And when I spar, I'm going to, it's in and out. That's how you got to be when you're sparring. But we're for real life situations. You know, uh, a, a ring situation that usually lasts throughout the average um, fight is nine minutes long. The average street fight is nine seconds long. Seconds, yeah. Uh, it's way quicker. And so you don't you don't have time to be jockeying back and forth. You, you do little feints and like you see in, but in sparring, yes, you absolutely have to do that. But in real life, it's, it's like that all comes way down. So if there was a feint, there might be one feint. There would not be any more feinting <laughs> beyond that in a real fight. Um, you know, most real fighting is close quarters combat. Rarely are you going to see two two people stay at range and just duke it out at range. The the losing guy instinctively is going to come in for a clinch because he's going to lose consciousness or he's he can't block all the strikes. So it's natural to either run away or to come in close. Those are the two safest um, ranges. Uh, you call it range four is kicking range. Range three is punching range. Range two is knees and elbows, and range one is grappling range. And your your safest range is range one. And you're so close that their strikes can't really do anything. They can bite you, but you can you can hold them away from you. Or beyond range four, where they can't even kick you. You run away. That's obviously the best. But most people, their ego gets them involved in fights that they could have easily run away from if that was their focus. And that's always my focus. I'm not one of these machismo dudes that wants to get in a fight and prove how badass I am. I've won and lost many fights, just as anyone who's been competitive in the fighting world long enough will have done. Nobody, <laughs> you don't just win. It's just, you have bad days. There's guys that are better than you in certain areas. There's, there's reasons that you're, everyone's going to lose at some point. And so the only winning philosophy when it comes to self-defense is getting the heck out of there. Okay. You win. You win by not being in the situation. And you find that when you train martial arts, one of the main things you learn is situational awareness. And it's one of the most important things that you can learn to keep yourself out of needing to be in a self-defense scenario. You see it before it comes. You know the rules of stupid. Don't be with stupid people at stupid places at stupid times. If you do all three of those things, you're almost guaranteed to have to defend yourself in some stupid situation. But if you know the rules of stupid and don't violate at least two of them, at a time, uh, you can probably avoid most situations. And if you, you know, keep your back to the the back of a room and you can see the door, if you pay attention, your head on a swivel. Don't get too involved in conversations. Never wear headphones in public. Don't look at your cell phone too much when you're in public. If you maintain a level of situational awareness, like myself, for example, it's going to be. I mean, somebody with a knife could probably sneak up behind me and stab me. There's certain things you can never fully be aware of but i mean unless you're ninja like if you're trying to sneak up behind me somewhere in public i mean i'll probably no i it i'm obsessed about it it's again like truth <laughs> when, I, when i get i get into something like this it, why not why not uh do it to the to the nth degree like why why learn martial arts pretty good but then i end up <laughs> end up dying because i didn't go 100 yeah. percent or whatever <laughs> uh, so or maybe ninety nine percent, like I said, with my black and white thing. I, I, I'm, um, I don't like getting obsessed to the point that it's it's clear that you've you've maybe unbalanced some other aspect of your life, <laughs> like some people might do. 
Um, but I also want to be as good as I can practically be at things. I, I, I aim to be a renaissance man I have throughout my, my life, and I've gotten, so I'm really good at a lot of things. You'll know, If you know me in my personal life, you'll notice that Eric's like, like nine out of 10 on a lot of things. Thanks. I'm really good at, but I'm not 10 out of 10 at pretty much anything. Like almost nothing in my life am I like really good at. Like really, like I'm, I'm only quite good at lots of things, which, which is enough for me, and I get bored. If I were to try to obsess about something to be the best, whatever, I just get so bored of it and I don't even want to do it anymore. And I, I go the opposite direction. I'll just stop completely. And I know that about myself. So like I said, I stay, I stay at the, the high shades of gray. <laughs>